Imagine with me that we are living inside of a highly sophisticated, full immersion, virtual reality video game that spans our entire lives from birth until death. We're thrown into this world with no knowledge of the game, not given any objectives, and this world is so real, so complete, so expansive, and so flawlessly executed that there's almost no way of knowing that we are even playing. But somewhere deep inside we have the sense that things are not quite what they seem, and the game reveals itself. Join me now as we seek to fully understand the true nature of reality to obtain spiritual enlightenment and to lay down the rules for the game of life. Hello out there. Thank you so much for being with us for the first ever episode of this little podcast. As you may have guessed from the intro, I plan to explore spiritual matters on this program, mostly surrounding enlightenment and understanding the true nature of reality, using the idea that this life is taking place inside of some kind of video game or simulated reality. I have some very good reasons for taking this particular approach to spirituality, and those reasons will be revealing themselves as we go on. But in addition to that, I plan on covering topics related to health, nutrition, and natural living. And on that tip, today's guest is rogue medical doctor turned champion bodybuilder, Todd Lee, MD. After leaving a life of practicing medicine behind, Todd went on to win, and has been continuing to win, numerous bodybuilding championships, and has been the coach to many other winners. He uses his sophisticated knowledge of biochemistry, physiology, and deep understanding of how the body works to push the sport to new heights, to push his body far beyond that of any mere mortal, and to formulate his finely crafted line of supplements with his company Valhalla Labs. This podcast ran longer than I planned, but it is filled with great stuff. In the first hour, we hear about Todd's experience with medical school, working at a hospital, and his switch into bodybuilding. The second hour is all about diet and the biochemistry of muscle growth. We talk about the vegan diet, the carnivore diet, fasting, autophagy, and we hear about Todd's supplements and how they work synergistically to help him maintain his superhuman strength. In the third hour, we start to get a little weird talking about the multidimensional nature of reality, and we begin to explore the concept that we may be living inside of a video game. I do want to warn you though, the good doctor has a very foul mouth and absolutely no interest in being politically correct. So make sure the kids are not around when you listen to this one. But he is hilarious and had me cracking up the whole time, and even more so when I was playing this back in editing. Not only that, but I learned a lot too, and I hope you will as well. Here we go. Alright, so Dr. Todd Lee. Very nice to see you, my friend. Good to see you too, buddy. As uh, I'm sure nobody out there knows, you are actually my oldest friend in the world. We met in what? <laughs> we met in fourth grade, I think, when we bonded over Ninja Turtles and Batman, the important yeah. things in life. 1987. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been a long time since then. And I would say yeah. that you have come a long way. And I'm very, you, sir. very interested in hearing all about what you're up to today let me see here so the last time we saw each other was really around high school graduation (laughs) (laughs) and obviously you've done a lot since then you've gone to med school you've started your company and i think a good place to start would be if you just introduce yourself and I want to hear about your overall experience with med school, how much you thought the pharmaceutical industry was involved in your education, and why you chose not to practice. Okay, so my name is Todd Lee. I'm an MD. Um, I've got a biochemistry degree, a psychology degree. I almost completed my master's in neuropsychopharmacology when I got into medical school, but by not doing my thesis paper 
I was able to start med school a year and a half earlier because of the way that the start times added up. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but trust me, it's true. And I got through med school, graduated top of my class, and I now lift weights for a living. Uh, where did so, you go to med school? <laughs> uh, I went to um, undergrad was U of M, master's was Wayne State Medical School, and I had really high um, MCAT scores, but a really shitty attitude towards school <laughs> and grades, so I didn't even spell check the application. <laughs> Whereas when I applied to Wayne, and I only applied to Wayne, because like the advisor for U of M, he's the advisor for all the U of M's, was like, he like jumped out of his seat at my MCAT score. He's like, no one's ever seen this score at any of the schools except for like Michigan itself. Michigan State, nobody's seen a score like this. You could go anywhere you want. He had like, I, was, I had no idea you were this smart. But um, so I basically didn't apply to anywhere but one school and then just threw a low ball at the, um, the little paperwork. You know, like you watch those movies and like, there's some girl who has this amazing speech at the end of the movie that she like recites out loud to the school board. And even though she shouldn't be able to get in, she gets into like Harvard because she's got some award winning speech. I'm the polar <laughs> opposite. Like mine was like 15 sentences. It's like, I want to be a doctor because I'm smart enough. <laughs> you know, like something like that. And so I didn't get in. <laughs> so it was like, <laughs> and so I was like, they're like, if you do this program and get a master's here, we'll let you in. So I was almost done with the master's and some other school called Ross let me in and it's in the Caribbean, but that means that they have rolling admission. So every three months they take a new class of 500 people and within the first month, about 250 drop out. And it's particularly hard because they try to prepare you to get really good licensing exams which people think are called the boards, but that's just something they say in movies. It's called the USMLE is what the actual name of the test is. And I did really good on that. <laughs> and I was going to go into neurosurgery, but I was actually in med school doing open brain surgery cases. And nobody does that, but I was. And it was horrible. Like, I fucking hated it. I hated getting up at 3.30 in the morning. I hated being there to see patients that are basically um, vegetables at like five in the morning. Then you're operating on people for headaches because there's a mass, but the consequences could be a lot worse headaches like paralysis or lack of memory or losing the ability to speak. It's just not worth it. And then you're in surgery until 6 p.m. and people are such fucking assholes to you because everyone's so unhappy. They're so cranky. Everyone's so mean all the time. So I wasn't a nice guy to begin with. So like being in an environment where everyone's a fucking cunt, you start treating people like shit more than before. So I get home, I do push-ups, and I'd ride the bike because that's the only exercise I could get. And my wife would be so pissed because I'd like walk past her to go to bed. Like that, that was life. And my wife was unhappy and I wasn't going to be able to keep her. So I switched to sports medicine. And it's like... While practicing in sports medicine, I could write diets for people and get them off their cholesterol meds, get them off their blood pressure meds, help them lose weight. Which most doctors can't do. Right. <laughs> and I would just look at the exercise sheet they were given before they had rotator cuff surgery or before they had knee surgery and actually try to get them to perform it in the office and they can't do it. So I have to actually walk them through it. So when I took the time to walk them through the handout they got at their orthopedic surgeon's office, they were able to do the exercises. And when they went home and did them regularly, like I wanted them to, they got better and they didn't need surgery. So I ended up costing the hospital so much fucking money and I ended up never prescribing drugs. I was only writing diets and they're like, you're not qualified to do this. I'm a medical doctor, which basically means I have every other medical degree combined. I'm a champion bodybuilder and a champion powerlifter. It's like I'm literally the best person for doing what I do. And then they got so mad that they fired me. And so I was like, I could go and grovel and get into another hospital, or I could just coach girls for bikini competitions. 
So for years, I did just bikini contest prep while I myself continued to do bodybuilding. And then I ended up getting a job as a article writer for a website called Mind and Muscle, which was owned by the guy who owned LG Supplements, which was the company that was my sponsor. So I wrote articles for Mind and Muscle, and then I designed their product line, and I revamped and designed their Liquid Labs line. And the day that I finished the Liquid Labs line, I got fired because they didn't need me anymore. And so I started my own company, Valhalla Labs, and I started doing all online coaching, almost no in-person coaching. And so instead of having a bunch of women who wanted in-person training, with online coaching, you get mostly men who just want diet and training and programs. And it ends up being way lower stress, and you get more money per hour time invested. Let's say I have appointments at the gym, and I'm there for six hours, plus I'm supposed to get my workout in. So really, it's a nine-hour workday. So what happens if the first person is difficult? Now I'm going to be a dick to everyone who comes after that person. It's like if you've ever been to court, what happens when someone in front of you pisses off the judge? Everyone after that person <laughs> goes to jail. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's going to jail because someone pissed off the judge. I've had clients tell me, it's like, as soon as I saw you walking through the parking lot, I knew that I was in for getting it. I've had people say, like, I'd sit in my car and cry before the session, <laughs> and then I'd hobble out to my car and cry after the session. But those people were the ones who won their first show. You know, like, they did what I fucking made them do, and they won. You know, and that's another thing is when someone sticks with it and they can do what I want, they will do very well. It's just I have extremely high expectations that very few people have the motivation to meet. A subcomponent of your question I didn't answer was what did the pharmaceutical company have to do with my education? Because I went out of the country, I didn't have any pharmaceutical company involved at all in my education. So whereas in the Americas, you're basically taught to rack up someone's bill with a bunch of unnecessary tests and blood draws. And you basically just gouge people for 30 fucking thousand bucks because they have a sore toe when they come to the ER. In the Caribbean, there's no money. And it's national health care. Okay. So you're taught to use your ability to ask a question, get an interview, and hear their symptoms. Then use common sense and deductive reasoning like an actual detective. Then you examine them with physical exam. And you come up with a differential diagnosis based on that, then you use the most cost efficient means possible to treat them. So if instead of running $900 worth of tests to figure out which $3 pill to use, you just use the most probable pill and then have them come back in three days to see what the results were. I was considered to be really cheap because I got to the United States and I'd be in the ER. There'd be these women that would come in with, like, emotional mood anxiety attacks, and then they're working them up for heart attacks. And I'm like, okay, like, draw their blood and run them for trypomyosin to see if we have actual heart markers. But there's no reason to do all these imaging studies. There's no reason to do this. There's no reason to do that. You're just going to drive up their bill. And then they're like, but that's how the hospital makes money is driving up these bills. But I'm definitely the MD that doesn't get along with other MDs and doesn't think like MDs. I wanted the highest degree known to man because I never liked the concept of a lesser being questioning me. And you remember that from high school. Is I basically saw people as just, you have no right to question me. You're inferior. You know, whereas if I at least had the degree <laughs> to back it up, I would curtail the argument before it started in most cases. Okay, I wanted to go into diet. Because you were talking about how you actually got fired for telling people yeah. what they should eat. So I, that's something I'm very interested in and in understanding what an actual human diet looks like. So I've had patients take their diets to the regular doctor. And every time of the feedback is always the same. They're just like, this is the best fucking diet I've ever seen. Which is, you would think it'd be the opposite. You'd think that another doctor wouldn't want to share domain 
It's like, he's not really a doctor. He's just some meathead bodybuilder. He doesn't know anything. No, nope, never say that. Like my diet that I have people on is pretty simple. It's like meal one is egg whites and whole eggs fried in coconut oil mixed with spinach. And the coconut oil is there to activate the liver to make um, the uh, ketones. Then the next meal is beef and whatever vegetables they want. Then the next meal is fish or chicken fried in coconut oil and whatever vegetables they want. Then they lift. Then the next meal is fish or chicken and white jasmine rice. And then the last meal is turkey and sweet potato. Okay. And so it's pretty comp. I mean, it's pretty comprehensive. But I also have a multivitamin product that has mushrooms in it, fruit, vegetables, herbs, minerals, digestive enzymes, probiotics omega-3s, and a little bit of fiber. There's this video I keep hearing about. I haven't seen it. It's called Game Changers. It's about these it's vegan athletes. So I definitely want it's to hear hear your thoughts on a vegan diet, especially where athleticism is concerned. And what, so I, what might be lacking? I can't do better than Dr. Sean Baker when he broke down that video. Is that I had my opinions and I was skeptical, but I watched his video. He went through... He knew each one of those athletes' history, and in each and every instance, their performance was worse, objectively, on the vegan diet. What elements are not in there? What's the problem, and how much are these people having to rely on supplementation, and particularly where protein is concerned? All right, so this is actually an area that I'm very near and dear to. I wanted to believe it was true that like 2012 I was called into the LG Sciences office remember I was sponsored by that company I wasn't an employee but I got free reign to I was on their magazine cover I would get as free photo shoots I'd get free trips with as much of an entourage as I want to Miami or Vegas to compete for free I got all the supplements I wanted if I needed money I could just go ask for it whatever I want so I would go in and he would say, you know, like, this is what we're doing for this protein. And we want to use pea protein, but the source is either from France or it's from Canada. And the sourcing isn't the same and it's a different level of bitterness and it clumps differently. So we have to flavor every batch. And we're having all these problems with this pea protein. So pea protein's great. It's got arginine, which is good for nitric oxide. It's got glutamine, which is great for recovery. It doesn't have a lot of the branched chain amino acids, which are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. Is it um, are, is that um, all essential amino acids included in there, or is it incomplete in that sense? I have I believe that pea is one of the few things that is complete, theoretically, but it doesn't have enough of the leucine to activate the mTOR trigger. Right. So you're not going to get muscle protein synthesis. And the main reason to drink a protein shake after you lift is to initiate the muscle protein synthesis. And a lot of people don't get that. The, the, a lot of people do almost everything wrong. But from my point of view as my education and perfectionist nature, I would never be happy with anything anyone ever did. Well, so I can't really use that mindset. Let me ask but, you this, though. Since we're talking about mTOR, uh, what about that, insulin in that equation? That's, insulin activates the AKT pathway. And then usually if you've got GH and insulin present, IGF-1 is released, and then IGF-1 activates mTOR and a AKT. But wait, so I, don't vegans so, fear IGF-1? Right. A, a most normal mainstream society thinks IGF-1 causes death, and IGF-1 causes cancer. IGF-1 is your main best growth hormone. Growth hormone is a growth hormone through the function of IGF-1. And the reason why people die who are bigger is because when you're bigger, you die younger. You know, let me I'll give you an example. There is a 120-pound rich guy who is telling me that he does everything possible to not take IGF-1. And he, I, he's a stepdad of like two of my lawyers who are my best friends since I was little kids, right? And um, I was like, IGF-1 is the most great thing in the universe and that people pay $1,000 a milligram. It's like 100 times more precious than gold. And he goes, well, why do people die 
when they have it. I'm like, it makes you bigger. When you're bigger, you die younger because your heart's the same size. But if you're 200 pounds versus 130 pounds, you're not going to live as long because you got 70 pounds more tissue to support. Well, one thing I recently learned is that being short is also associated with longevity. And the same thing we can see in dogs where a large breed dog is shorter life. That was the life. example I gave to him. Is I'm like, if you had a five pound dog, that fucker's going to live 20 years like a cat. If you have a hundred pound dog, that guy's going to live 13 years. It's not because it's the same, pretty much around the same size heart. It's just a much bigger animal. So it has, the heart has to work harder. And he was just like floor struck. <laughs> it never occurred to him the reason why IGF-1 made you die young is because it made you bigger. I was like, you know what? I'd rather be a big, strong man and die at 80 than be a tiny, weak, useless man and die at 120. Well, but hold and, on, because muscle is associated with longevity. And if you don't have muscle, like that's something people often die of is the muscle loss. Right. Well, when they're old, they usually die because they break their hip and then they get pneumonia. And that's because they don't have enough muscle to support the body. Yeah. And I think that's not based on age. That's based on inactivity. I've seen plenty of 60, 70, and 80-year-old bodybuilders that are in better shape than 30-year-olds. And that's because when you consistently exercise and eat with some reasonable mindfulness, you will age at a much slower rate because you're going to release more growth hormone. And I definitely want to get back to an optimal diet, but in like the keto sphere and like the health and longevity people, they're often also afraid of mTOR, activating mTOR too much. I'm wondering if you think it's possible to activate it too much, but at the same time, it seems that even just to grow new tissue, which our body has to do constantly, we absolutely need to be stimulating the growth. But then there's that other fasting state physiology that activates like autophagy and the AMP kinase. And how does all that balance? I mean, a lot of this stuff's just bullshit. So, I mean, why and exactly how um, autophagy, okay, autophagy, eating yourself. Yes. <laughs> so, to me, that doesn't sound good. Well, and I don't want to eat all my cells because they're like, well, new stem cells proliferate. The but here's the thing. What about um, like when senescent cells or organelles like malfunctioning mitochondria, like the recycling of those things to then create brand new tissue when, let's say you're fasting, your body's breaking down these internal components and then, you know, you balance that with eating, activating mTOR. And then it turns the stuff that broke down into brand new tissue. Well, normally DNA's got telomeres. And every time a DNA is replicated, it cleaves the type of telomere. We can only so do that so many times, telomere, right? Yeah, and then once that telomere is gone, the cell self-destructs. So I don't want to run out of a bunch of cells. That's how you get liver spots. That's how you get old. Aging is a function of cell destruction. So if you ever notice chicks who bathe, sunbathe a lot have wrinkled skin by 30, whereas some women who don't ever go out in the sun, they've got great skin at 50. And so that has to do with DNA damage and self-destruction of the tissue. So you're accelerating. People who drink and tan and smoke cigarettes, their skin on their face ages much faster than people who don't drink, don't tan, and don't do cigarettes. So to me, breaking down your body at a faster rate so it can recycle and have fresh cells means you're going to run out of replication. Now, of course, the body has a method to increase telomeres. It's a telomerase enzyme. It grows more telomeres. It's found in every cancer cell. So that by pushing the cells to generate more telomeres, that you're basically pushing all of the cells in your body to be more cancerous. Now, is what I'm saying bullshit? No. In theory, it makes perfect sense. I used a rational, sound, biochemical, microbiological argument to prove my point. But that's my point about their bullshit, is that there's not really any real good data to support their shit. They're just conceptualizing. You know, they're saying every great society has fasted since the dawn of time, blah, 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 blah. Yes, and those societies are 130 pounds, and they're five foot. <laughs> 
So if a bunch of six foot tall, 200 pound come, dudes come in with battle axes, they're going to hack your fucking asses up and take your women. So what's more important, being able to defend yourself or being able to live eating bean sprouts for five hours a day? <laughs> well, like it's just not feasible. I'm always trying to put things in a natural context as someone, you know, my degree is in anthropology. I focused on paleoanthropology and definitely those early humans were eating large quantities of meat. Um, but they were definitely probably going through periods of famine also. And really this is where ketosis might come in. I'm not necessarily talking about a ketogenic diet, but just not having food and having to survive off your own body fat, which is, of course, why we have body fat anyway. Well, and, but you, it seems like you can maintain peak fitness if you're fat adapted, and like, of course, you can go too far with that and end up harming yourself, but what, what are your thoughts there? I mean, people have, you got to understand what someone's called. Is their goal to be to live forever? Is their goal to age as slow as possible? Is their goal to exist or is it to succeed and dominate? And so based on the personality type, like if your goal is to just live harmoniously with nature and just walk softly and not carry a big stick, then eating vegetables and never activating mTOR, never eating IGF-1, you could probably live a very meek, harmless life for 130 years. That's great. My personal experience is chicks don't dig guys like that. Maybe they do in California. But what I'm used to seeing is the dudes with huge muscles and tattoos and motorcycles are the ones who get the chicks. And there's a reason for that is it's because women are programmed to have sex with masculine alpha males. They may complain about them. They may say toxic masculinity till they're blue in the face, but the same girls are completely different behind closed doors. That, no that's why girls don't like me. <laughs> well, it's not that they like me either, because I'm very <laughs> you know, But I'm just I'm giving an example of if you watch if you watch Walking Dead, no one is with that pussy priest. They want all the girls who watch Walking Dead want Daryl. Because Daryl's the bad motherfucker who can kill people, and guys who are killers are going to keep girls safe. And this is an instinctive thing. These are civilized women living in our cushy society that still are attracted to the ugly dude with the motorcycle and the crossbow. Because it doesn't matter what his face looks like, dude. what matters is he can keep you safe. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the reason why the show Vikings is more popular than, say, The View is because it's... If you, the people that are successful are the ones who are eating meat and are riding on boats and run up the hill and hack everyone up with the axes and take the gold back. You know, why was Sons of Anarchy attractive? Why did every girl name her pit bull Jax? Yeah, I've never seen <laughs> Sons of Anarchy is just a bunch of thugs running around selling drugs and guns and killing people. And it's like, People are like, oh, my God, you're so virtue signaling, toxic masculinity. I'm like, no, I'm looking at ratings, that the shows that are popular are the ones that have some type of aggressive outlet and activity. And I don't think that most men are going to want to have that walk the earth like Kang from Kung Fu approach where they just are vegan and they want to be as small as possible so they live as long as possible. They're going to want to have a very fun, exciting life for the shortest amount of time. And then once they are no longer able to enjoy their life, rather than living in a wheelchair on an oxygen tank and impotent, shitting in a diaper, they'd rather just be dead. And so I think that you can have both. I think you can live over 100 years and you can still be functional and healthy the entire time. But that is harder to do. You have to have a lot of precision and a lot of attention to detail, but you also can't ignore the other things that are useful. And I think getting too hung up on microscopic biochemical reactions that take place at the nucleus is not how you achieve a healthy life and a healthy physique. I think what makes sense is you go to the gym, you do what you like doing, 
and you eat the foods that agree with you that you like. And then if you need to turn the screws a little harder, you can investigate why isn't this body part growing? And why am I not losing this fat that I want to lose and improve your training or improve your diet? So you don't think it's possible at all to overstimulate mTOR? <laughs> that was all this question. Was. <laughs> I don't know. If, I've never heard of overstimulating mTOR. What I've heard is if you activate mTOR, which is an all or nothing threshold potential, more frequently than every four hours, you slow muscle protein synthesis. You don't accelerate it. Well, my, you know, I'm always looking at this from the health and longevity landscape not so much the bodybuilding. And a lot, a lot of people there have concerns that overstimulation of mTOR might lead to cancer in certain situations. Or if you have cancer, that perhaps you don't want to be stimulating mTOR all that much. But these same people, are they like, they're like, I love it when somebody's smoking cigarettes and they're drinking and they're eating sugar and they're like, you don't want to do that bodybuilding shit. You're going to get cancer. No, those these are, you know, like serious, like whole food. Uh... I don't think that doing something really healthy and extreme is a big risk for cancer. I think that that's pretty preposterous. That is fair enough. <laughs> I mean, how do you stimulate mTOR? Well, one way you stimulate mTOR is with 2.5 grams of leucine which is from about five ounces of uncooked meat. And wait, can you get that from a plant-based source? That there much, is that much leucine? No, there's almost no plant-based proteins that have a significant amount of leucine in a reasonable amount. And that's so one of the... So you could use a, a laboratory a, and a factory to mass produce some leucine by extracting it from powdered vegetables, <laughs> but that's not fucking natural anymore. Exactly. So it's... It's defeated the whole purpose of being one with nature and communing with Mother Nature. It's like, you're not communing with Mother Nature if you're drinking a fucking protein shake. And while we're on that tip about things you're not getting in a vegan diet, what else is missing? Other than leucine and B12, um, I would say it's more complicated, but most of the vegans I've met are emotionally stable. Oh, they seem very angry to me personally. <laughs> yeah, they're so fucking angry. And what people don't understand is if you have brain chemistry abnormalities, the first thing that's going to go is emotional stability. Like take a child and then it's perfectly well behaved. It's doing really good. Give it some sugar. It's bouncing off the walls. Wait an hour. <laughs> now it's cranky and miserable. Right. That's what vegans are at. They're like a kid that's came down after a sugar high, and it never stops. Well, they're just cranky, miserable people, and I don't need to know the exact biochemical thing they're missing to know that their brains ain't functioning right. Well, hold on here, because I I do have some ideas there. Um, if you look at what the brain is made out of, mostly fat. cholesterol, saturated fat, DHA. And every neuron has these myelin sheets, which are dependent on B12. So quite literally, those are all the animal-based foods. I've also heard creatine is, when they give them to vegans, their brains work better. Um, so, but again, if we're looking at this from an anthropological perspective, the moment the human ancestors start developing large brains is the same time we start to find hand axes and butcher marks on these animals and it makes sense if those are the building blocks of the brain i mean we're made out of meat we're not made out of plant matter so eating vegetables exclusively is fucking retarded we have eyes in the front of our head so we're natural born predators we have fangs your dad's a dentist i'm sure he's pointed this out to you before we don't just have molars so there's no fucking reason to think that we're complete herbivores. The argument is we've got molars and incisors, so we're supposed to eat both. And when they do stable isotope analysis of early human bones, they find like at least 90% of their calories are coming from animal sources. There's these like buffalo jump sites where they're herding large numbers of buffaloes off cliffs. Like, meat was an essential part of what made human beings human, no doubt. 
So I, it's funny that you said, okay, so let's take your hypothesis and run it through its model. So the brain is made out of animal fat, sphingomyelin, sphingolipids are what make up the myelin sheathing. The brain's almost all fats, basically. There's no real, I mean, there's protein, but not a lot. The amino acids in the brain are actually made up of proteins and amino acids. Um, not proteins, but amino acids. Um, and that's a, those are water-soluble. Yeah, they're all water-soluble. And if you were to autophage the shit out of it by not eating, <laughs> you're going to eat away at all your tissue in your brain. But if you're not eating more of those building blocks, which are only found in animal flat fat, people are like, what about avocados? It's like, you know what? There's not fucking avocados growing in every square inch of this fucking planet. Huh? There's no avocados in Scandinavia. Just shut the fuck up with your avocados. And That's even – Place. If you want to be vegan to get all your calories, you have to be eating these high starch grains and things, which only would have been available seasonally. There's no so, fruit available in the winter. But their whole okay, so I don't think they're trying to be paleo vegans. I think that they're the paleo argument is anti vegan intrinsically. Well, but, my point is that in the wild, it's impossible to be vegan because you cannot get enough calories to sustain your life. But and I, I think that mostly it's just going to be some California people who want to be vegan because it's trendy, and then it gets them likes on their posts. But there's all this but, propaganda making people think that this is the healthiest thing. And I myself, I when I first started researching this, I was under the mistaken impression that a raw food vegan diet was going to be the best diet. And then I tried it, and within months my health was destroyed. I found a lot of the MMA community are super big on this whole vegan thing. And their whole point was that one guy who beat Conor McGregor, they're like, he's vegan. And I looked at him like, the guy looks like shit. <laughs> it's like, and they're like, well, he's not trying to look good. I'm like, but if his diet's so fucking perfect, he wouldn't be covered in blubber and look soft. I was like, Conor looks a hundred times better than him. I want to eat what Conor's eating. So it's like, and I understand you're not supposed to be big and be a fighter because mass times velocity squared equals force. So the smaller your arm, the faster you can throw it through space. But that means you shouldn't be covered in blubber either. So the point is, is if you were to go through this intermittent fasting nonsense of autophagy and eat away at your brain, since you're not eating anything that can grow a new brain, you're eventually going to run out of brain, which would explain why they're so fucking angry all the time. Uh, that's very true. But hold on, let me back up here, because I have been intermittent fasting my whole entire life. I've mm -hmm. Like, all through high school, I never ate breakfast. I used to train martial arts hardcore, I would be training from 8 a.m. till about 11.30. I would not eat at all until after lunch. I used to walk 11 miles to school fasted. But then I eat lots of meat, and I get calories. I, and that's the way I'm looking at it, is I'm spending part of the day depleting glycogen, I'm running on ketones, fasted insulin, and then that same day... Like, every single day, I might spend part of the day in, like, a mild state of ketosis, and then later on, I'm activating the fuck out of mTOR. So, mm -hmm. and I've never been I, overweight. I, I don't have visceral fat. I think that it's a great way of doing it, especially if longevity and regular life is the goal. I think that what I do to take advantage of the advantages of intermittent fasting but not have the drawbacks is the first four meals that I have people eat have no carbs. And then they lift. And that's another and way. And then while their anabolic window is open, then they heat, have just starch and fast digesting protein. That way their pancreas thinks they've been intermittent fasting and their fasting, their window of eating carbohydrates and insulin is only four hours so that they only have seven hours of insulin in their bloodstream. The other 17 hours, they're in a state of relative ketosis right. and a lot of people are like oh it takes three weeks to get into ketosis i'm like you're not lifting hard enough yeah that i can go to the gym i can puff on like um a device that measures breath acetone and i can take a blood sugar ketone analysis and i will be like if the normal cutoff for ketosis is four i'll be at a six while i'm eating gummy bears and drinking sugar <laughs> right and i'll i'll go to bed and i'll wake up at a seven I can be in a perpetual state of ketosis because I'm that fucking fast metabolizer. 
that I lose weight if I drop below 4,000 calories. Which brings me to my point that intermittent fasting is that on the retarded side is because if I eat a meal that's 800 calories, like, okay, so this research I did on this to prove my point that it was just not worth your effort is if you take a person, you give them a shit diet, if you're mixing fat and carbs, specifically sugar, and you do it for 12 hours, they're wasting. If you give them their feeding window of 16 to 15 hours, they get obese. Mm -hmm. If you reduce that window to 10 hours, they're going to actually start to lose fat. My point is, but you're not calorie regulating. You're just letting them, it's not like you're eating the same 2,400 calories in a different window of time, that they're, you're limiting the window of time they can eat, and since they eat like shit, they're just eating less shit because you limited. So they did the same thing with somebody who was eating healthy. They did like a meat and starch program, not having any crap, and there was no difference in the testicles. Didn't matter if they were eating 15 hours, doesn't matter if they're eating 12 hours, doesn't matter if they're eating 10 hours, they never got fat. They never really lost fat. What they did find was cramming the same amount of food, if it's all clean, into 10 hours, slightly increased muscle protein synthesis, but that's probably because you just increased the amount of insulin that was released during that window. So if and, somebody, and that's going to activate mTOR. In, insulin, I think, it activates AKT. But insulin with growth hormone stimulates IGF-1, and IGF-1 activates the mTOR and the AKT. And the, anytime you have a protein load over 5 ounces, you'll get 2.5 grams of leucine, and that stimulates um, mTOR. Okay. So this is where I go with this. Okay. Let's say I'm going to have four meals, and you can stimulate mTOR every four hours or more, but not less. So if I'm going to cram four meals of like enough protein to hit my mTOR triggering point, in a 10-hour window, I'll stimulate mTOR at the first meal, I'm not going to stimulate it in the next meal because it's within the four hours. I'm not going to stimulate it again. I'm not going to stimulate it again. Now, if I was to spread out those meals and eat one meal every four hours for 16 hours, I will get four mTOR spikes in that day, stimulating up to four times as much. Now, if you sync that up with an insulin injection, then you're going to get even more IGF-1. So you're going to maximally stimulate AKT. You're going to maximally stimulate mTOR, and you're going to get the double effect of the IGF-1. And that's why so, you're saying you want, after they're working out, you're giving them starch as well as the branched-chain amino acids. Well, yes, the branched-chain amino acids from food, or if you're going to do powdered, I would go with essential amino acids. Because the branched chains by themselves, when the mTOR trigger occurs, there needs to be all 20 amino acids present. Otherwise, muscle protein synthesis won't fire. And when people have these whey protein shakes, it's in and out in an hour. So you're not actually giving yourself the nutrients to grow muscle. You're just stimulating the mTOR. So the only way that a whey protein shake would work at 7 p.m. would be if at 5 or 6 p.m. you had a huge meal. I have this idea, well, I guess it's not really mine, but I look at food as being information that interacts with us, um, you know, genetically at the informational level. And when you consume meat, I think the body knows exactly what it's eating. And it says, oh, here's meat. That's made of muscle. Let me go put this in muscle. Same thing if you say, have some bone broth that's collagen-rich. It says, oh, that's collagen. I know that. I'm going to use that to make collagen. Right. But then if the if the flip side is if you're using like a pea protein, there's no analog to that in, the, in an animal body. So the body then looks at this base and they break it all down and says, okay, I have these amino acids. And then it's going to choose each one for the most pressing need it has at the time, which may not be muscle. Um, and I think this is a good segue into talking about animal, like the active animal-based nutrition versus the plant analog. So, like, if you have, like, a vegan's getting all their vitamin A, so to speak, from carotenoid precursors. That's not vitamin A. The body has to make a conversion to turn that into vitamin A. 
And every time it does that, it's going to take energy and it's going to take resources to make that conversion that otherwise, that basically you're wasting resources that it could use for something else. So it's almost depleting you because you're choosing to not, or to take the plant analog versus the direct nutrient that the body can use. Yeah, I mean, like, you, you hit the nail on the head. You're not going to build a brick shit house out of wood and plastic. You, in order to build a brick shit house, you have to use bricks. So if you want to build muscle, you need to eat muscle. You can't eat a bunch of fruity, foo-foo shit and build a hard, muscular physique. And people will always say, there's natural bodybuilders. No, there isn't. There are natural fitness models who claim to be bodybuilders. But if you go look at the Olympia stage, the top 20 bodybuilders in the world, not a single fucking one of them is a vegan. So people are like, well, I don't want to be a bodybuilder. It's like, that's not the fucking point. These are the experts at building muscle and retaining muscle while losing fat. They're literally the most muscular, leanest people on the fucking planet. They're the experts at building muscle and losing fat. No one's better. It's like saying you don't want to race in NASCAR, so you're not going to take a, di a driving lesson from <laughs> Dale Park Jr. Motherfucker knows how to drive better than you. Shut the fuck up and take the lesson. You know, it's like he doesn't drive with his feet. He drives with his fucking hands, like everyone else doing NASCAR. So just because you're not a NASCAR doesn't mean it's a good idea to drive with your feet or with your teeth or with your pubes. <laughs> that, you, that you have hands, use your fucking hands. So you said, why waste energy converting some shit plant crap into the human version of it when you could eat an animal and get it? And when it all comes down to the bottom line, it's, I like animals. You like animals. Most of people like animals. Honest people like animals more than people. Liars don't mind when other humans lie to them and treat them like shit and betray them. But my dog is not going to betray me. He's not going to treat me like shit. He's going to be happy to see me. He's going to want to cuddle. And he's going to want to be my best friend. All my best so, friends are animals. Right. So I love animals. So I don't want to eat animals. The shitty thing is too fucking bad <laughs> because there's nothing better to eat than animals. And in it nature, doesn't, it's way, just you don't get what you want. It's real life. You don't get what you want. You get what you get. You the, don't throw a fit. The way nature works is that one thing always has to die so something else can live. Even if it's a plant, you're still killing a plant. That is a living thing. I make no distinction between the consciousness of a plant and an animal. I think plants I think plants feel every bit as much as animals. I think they are probably even more aware than us, probably in ways we can't even comprehend. The thing is they, they don't have a nervous system, so they have to be a spiritual connection if they have a connection. But they do have networks of like electrical signaling that we can look at kind of like a, a nervous system and they make things that in our bodies are neurotransmitters, so there's definitely communication happening in that organism and have you ever seen a like time lapse footage of plants that's when they come alive like you can see them like reaching to grab stuff and like those things are just as alive i do not make that distinction and even though i love animals i consider it a disservice to myself to allow my health to suffer like it's not a cruelty to kill if it's to protect yourself or someone else so if i want my body to be healthy, then I have to eat something that makes it healthy. I just, um, I can't really justify shit because I get my chicken at Walmart and I don't know how Walmart treats its chickens. <laughs> you know, and it, it's like... <sighs> in a, in I, an I, ideal world, though. So what we Again, I'm always trying to put it in a natural perspective. I investigated hemp protein and it was like a one gram of fiber for every two grams of protein. So you were going to be shitting your brains out if you tried to hit 400 grams of protein a day with hemp protein. And you'd have to supplement it with so much leucine to make it effective. Leucine is not water soluble. It's chalky and it's powdery. It's refined from bacteria. If you see the movie with Matt Damon called The Informer, that's when the, um, farm, that's when the corn syrup industry figured out that if they re-engineer the bio, the DNA of bacteria to make leucine, 
they can grow vats of leucine with bacteria and then give it to the corn and the corn could make more high fructose corn syrup faster. So I was like, to me, that's basically like when you get free form amino acids from a company in a white powder, it's basically like you're getting bacteria proof that we've reprogrammed the DNA of the bacteria to shit out the amino uh, acids. Hold on here, because bacteria proof is actually a great source of nutrition. When we talk about what a probiotic is, it's something that poops out nutrients. And I know. One of the things that I recently learned about vitamin D is that it's needed by the B vitamin producing bacteria in the gut to produce B vitamins. And I think that is a good time to start talking about mitochondria and the nutrition needed to convert food into energy because the B vitamins are like the top of my list for, for that. I want to hear what you think. That's a good point. I probably don't get as much B vitamins as I should, except for I eat so much meat in a day. I probably get some from that. I eat about three pounds of chicken a day. I figure that probably gets me covered. Even trace amounts of nutrients are going to be found when you're eating pounds of the shit. So, well, actually, um, I know we were talking about, we had a brief interaction on Instagram, and you mentioned that the carnivore diet might leave you nutrient deficient. Um, I, did, I was saying I, it, most likely it, but both here, vegetables only or meat only would be missing something. But here is where we get into the nose to tail aspect because like the white meat chicken has a lot of B vitamins. Um, you know, the dark meat is going to have more of the fat solubles. Mm -hmm. And when you eat the whole animal, like... Inside that animal are mitochondria. Inside all those mitochondria are the electron transport chains that are running. When you consume that, all that nutrition is in there. Right, and so, that's something I've always felt, too, is like, look, if I'm an animal and my muscles need something, if I'm eating muscles, I'm getting it. Whether the vegetarians believe it or not, I don't care. I can use common sense. And there's a lot of uh, bad, there's a lack of research into the nutrition in meat. And even, well, intentionally. Probably. Even vitamin C, if you think about it, almost every animal can produce vitamin C. It, it, they do that in the liver, and then it goes out through the water tissues. So meat has vitamin C. There's, it's in there. Especially if you're eating liver, it stores in the kidneys, in the adrenals, I think in the thymus. So People just overthink it. Like, look, if you are an animal, then eating another similar animal is going to give you everything. Like, let's, let's be even simpler. If I ate people, <laughs> and I went out and I ate vegans, <laughs> or if I ate somebody with an omnivorous diet, I would probably feel better eating the omnivore than I would from eating the vegan. Because if they're miserable because they don't have appropriate nutrition, why would I get all the nutrition I need because their meat won't have what they don't have? Exactly. It's just like breast milk. It's like there's a lot of these idiots who breastfeed their kid because they want to have omega-3s, and you're like, do you take fish oil? They're like, no. Do you eat fish? They're like, no. <laughs> I'm like, then you don't have any omega-3s to put in your fucking breast milk. Well, again, in here, like eggs, you can get that. or And we're talking about grass-fed versus uh, – well. If somebody's not sophisticated enough to take fish oil capsules, they probably aren't smart enough to buy organic. But here, Someone like you can do the research, but the general people I'm used to dealing with are not that smart. They can't even – they don't even know to flip the container over and look at the back. They literally don't know that much. They take a true. picture of the front and they're like, is this good? <laughs> <laughs> Got to know what's in like, it, buddy. <laughs> so it looks like awesome fucking marketing. You what about the back where the information is? But here, the omega-3s, at least in a properly fed animal, is going to be a structural component of every single cell membrane. Right, and I agree and, that that's where I'm agreeing with you. If you eat a healthy animal, you will be a healthy animal. And so I get what they're saying, whereas if you eat organic beef that's grass-fed, all beef's grass-fed. The corn-finished beef is just more marbled. But if you eat a corn-finished animal's least marble part like a round steak you don't really have to worry about it but You're not getting that if the animal's fed exclusively corn which doesn't have omega-3s like if they're fed these usda subsidized grains i don't grains, think they're 
are any that are fed to sweet corn. I think their corn's finished. Uh, I, think, fed- I think most of them, the, in the capos, are exclusively fed. They might be given some hay and stuff, but I know they're given a lot of corn, soy, wheat, the, the subsidized grains that are really cheap to feed, which are all omega-6. And again, mm-hmm. talking about what the body's doing on the molecular level here, let's say it doesn't have enough omega-3s, but it has too much omega-6. It's going to try to use the omega-6 in place of where it wants to use omega-3s because that's the closest thing it can find. And then okay. we hear that omega-6 causes inflammation. It's not that omega-6 causes inflammation. It's that the body doesn't have the omega-3, so it's sticking the wrong shape molecule in its place. So I want to point out something, though, that inflammation is the process that grows muscle. It's also so, healing. Right. So if you are someone who lifts weights for the purpose of getting more muscular, you want inflammation. The more sore you get, the more you're going to grow if you keep eating protein. That omega-3s, which fight inflammation, slow your muscular gains. Right. And so it's not just an issue of something's good or something's bad. It's an issue of who are you and what are you trying to do. That not if, if you sell hammers, every problem is a nail. <laughs> but not every problem is a nail. Sometimes it's a screw. And you need a screwdriver, not a hammer. So it's better to have multiple tools, not just one tool you try to use to fix all problems. And what these ideologues that aren't scientists don't get is just because you want people to like you and think you're smart, you don't have to shove your vegan beliefs down everyone's throats. Some people have an O blood type and have been proven based off of ancestral DNA to respond better to meat. And some people have an A blood type and have been because their ancestors come from Asia, they do better on vegetarian diets. It's not based on the blood type; it's based off the ancestral homeland. And people with an O blood type are from North Europe, and people with an A blood type tend to be from Asia. There could be Asians who do better on a blood on a, a carnivore diet. There could be Scandinavians who do better on vegans. But this is just general broad scopes of trying to guess where an individual might do their best. And I think people don't have enough of an open mind to be willing to accept that there isn't a black and white answer to these things. I'm always trying to put this in a natural perspective. And I think human beings, the largest time, uh, the majority of the time we're on this planet, this ice age glacial condition, we are very lucky to be living in this interglacial period where we have a warm earth and there's a lot of plant foods out there that we would not have had access to most of the time that we existed and at the same time during the ice age there are all these megafauna that we don't have today so back then you know uh, this also depends on if you're closer to the equator or more towards uh, you know the poles but Back then, there was a lot more meat walking around, basically. Well, that makes me confused, though, because, like, what does a mammoth, what does a giant sloth eat? Well, they eat plants. But there were no plants. Well, all right, mammoth are actually uh, from subtropical regions. If you remember, they were all found in Siberia, flash frozen. Like, they still found tropical flowers in their mouths and digestive tract. Something crazy happened on the Earth that separated this last glacial from the interglacial. This was when the last major extinction happened. And, I mean, this might sound crazy, but it seems to me that some type of crustal displacement took place where the crust of the Earth actually moved itself so that places that were once tropical shifted to now being frozen Kind of like how India broke off of Africa, slammed into Asia, and created the Himalayas. Are you suggesting that Siberia used to be in South America, basically? Basically. It was, or at least it was at a similar latitude. Or like Australia or something like that. It was Australia, too. And in Antarctica, or it might be the Arctic, but there's evidence of like trees that once had lots of rain that are now iced over. <laughs> So something crazy happened on this planet that separated 
the like the Paleolithic from the modern time, and that really changed the way human beings eat. And if you think about, there's evidence that we were eating almost all animal foods before when we had all this access to the megafauna, but when they went extinct, this was the same time um, the Clovis culture in the Americas went extinct. So something happened, human beings were even almost wiped out, and in, at that point, they started to turn more to plant foods to, because um, there, was, there was more pressure to get calories because they weren't able to hunt as easily. And it, that's the point that uh, even, you know, since it was warmer, there's more plants growing, there's more sugar out there, there's more grains, and they wouldn't have had that before that event. So plant foods kind of seem to me as human beings trying to survive during this period that was practically unsurvivable. Yeah, you know way more about it than me, and that's definitely <laughs> something I'm very interested in is prehistoric times and early civilizations and what why that we defeated the neanderthals really you well, know that is, if they have a bigger skull why would wouldn't they have a bigger brain you know that kind of stuff i but, i have some uh i think there's a lot of assumptions people make in regards to human evolution uh, I definitely don't think there's evidence that Darwinian evolution of natural selection is what leads one species into another. I think a lot of, like the Cam Cambrian explosion, where after an extinction event, suddenly all these new species just pop out of nowhere. That flies in the face of what we're told of the slow evolution that happens. And I, you know, we still carry some Neanderthal DNA, so obviously we were interbreeding. And if we were able to interbreed and create fertile offspring, then that's the definition, of, definition of it's the, the same, same species. species. So I have this idea that, all right, in school when we were studying this, we talked about lumpers versus splitters. There's right. the people who want to split all these different animals, early humans with different morphological characteristics into different species, and there's people that want to lump them together as the same species. And I'm basically the ultimate lumper. I see all this as a progression. The way I see it happening, for some reason, there's, all right, hold on, let's back up. There's only a few ways to get new genetics into a population. There's gene flow from another population that comes in. There's recombination and mutation. I think that's it. I might be missing one. Well, so, got it. so, let's, for whatever reason, this was a period of high mutation. There's all these new characteristics popping out. For kind, like X kind of, yes. Yeah, so, got some meteor that crashes the earth, has a bunch of cosmic radiation, possibly so um, radiates the fuck out of people. Possibly Everybody um, radiated, gets killed, except for the few that survive have like some changes to their DNA. There's some new gene expressions of exomes, and then within the 2,000, 3,000 years, you've got viable new species. Wait, hold on, because uh, possibly this mechanism is actually the pole shift, where the magnetic yeah. reversal happens which means that the Earth is no longer protected from cosmic radiation. So literally, we just have this influx of radiation from space. Radiation. So that's what that's definitely a possibility. But for whatever reason, we have... Just random shit. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so basically, we have high mutation for whatever reason, and we're seeing these new characteristics pop up because of that. But these animals need to be able to breed together in order for those mutations to spread out into the populations and then the ones that are favorable end up getting passed on and boom we end up having new species but it's not the way darwin or everyone is assuming that it happens the second theory of darwin which is sexual selection <laughs> that it's not about what the fittest is it's what's the most fuckable or <laughs> like so the example is blue eyes popped up in Scandinavia only like 10,000 years ago. And within three or 4,000 years, 95% of the population had blue eyes, even though it's a recessive trait, uh -huh. <laughs> which means that nobody was banging those brown eyes. <laughs> Something I wanted to hear you talk about, which we haven't touched at all, is your supplements and <laughs> the ingredients in there and how why you chose them to, for what purposes? 
Well, so the supplement industry is kind of a joke that what it does is it hires professional bodybuilders to push these supplements that are supposed to sound like steroids and other performance enhancing drugs, but are usually just caffeine and sugar. And over the past, I want to say five years, there started to be some brand integrity where they, people got sick of the fact that any real bodybuilders don't use supplements because they're toxic waste. So certain bodybuilders would make brands that they would use. Like, here's some shit I will actually use, like essential amino acids, carbohydrate powders, something to increase nitric oxide synthesis in the muscle. You know, they basically made products that a bodybuilder could actually use. And those companies didn't do well and they collapsed. So what I try to do is I wanted to make supplements that would actually work and I wanted to release them at a cheaper price than any other supplements. So I wasn't really competing with the existing market by trying to release the same ingredients at a cheaper price. I was basically looking at what would I use to accomplish this goal, design the product based off of NCBI studies showing double blind human results or the closest thing I could get to class one evidence. And once I had this, okay, maximum dose of this, 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 not that are overlapping in effect that are competing for the same receptor, but had synergistic functions that did the same basic thing, but from a different way. So when you use them together, it give, gives a better result. So for instance, we discussed AKT or mTOR as muscle protein synthesis pathways. Well, people are like, well, why would you use both? Because like one plus one isn't two, one plus one equals four when you do something synergistically. Yeah. So when it comes to my sleep product, it's synergistically effective. When it comes to the pre-workout, I have a three different mechanisms of nitric oxide synthesis, and I approach it from a different angle. I'm increasing the nitric oxide synthase. I'm delivering free-form nitric oxide, so you get immediate pump. Then there's the precursor to nitric oxide, arginine alpha ketoglutarate. Then there is, once the arginine supplies get low, citrulline back converts into arginine for a reservoir mm -hmm. of nitric oxide first precursor. So I get a threefold increase in nitric oxide synthase, but it doesn't just stop there. The product you take earlier in the day, Thor's hammer, has the agnetine sulfate in it to activate the enzyme you would use later in the day when you take the pre-workout. So it's really the whole supplement line is one product. It's just it's broken up in when you take it, not what they do. So it's completely different than every other supplement company. No one else does it like that. They're like, they're trying to market you on a desired result. And they're like, we want you to take this to grow muscle. And it's got everything under the sun that can grow muscle, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's when you want to take it. So it's just a stupid way to do anything. And if you take everything, I remember once I looked at all the ingredients one brand used. For every, their entire line, if you took it, you ended up getting 1,800 milligrams of caffeine in a day. So that's obviously not survivable for long periods of time. You couldn't trust them to take the whole line. The bigger a fan you are of that line, the more likely you're going to make it dead. Right. So I'm definitely not that guy. <laughs> I have to take into consideration that I can't slam the maximum dose of a particular ingredient into one product if I'm going to be giving it to them at three times a day. There's, um, Wrath has Yohimbine in it. The Wrath cream that comes with the pills has topical Yohimbine. So you can target the part of the body you want to burn fat from. Then when you take the capsule, it activates all this fat burning machinery and facilitates fat burning. Then when you actually do the cardio, you burn the fat. But you couldn't, like, take the capsules and apply the cream and then go jerk off and go to sleep and get fat burning because you need to be in a calorie deficit. And the main point, people take fat burning pills before they do cardio, and they usually do cardio fasting. So the whole thing is set up on a basic premise that the person knows what they're doing. Because if you're going to market the people who know what you're doing, then the people that don't will emulate in theory as best they can approximate what the people who know what they're doing is. If you're trying to market the couch potatoes, 
with a bunch of fitness nutrition shit. They're going to buy it, use it once or twice, not get any results, and they're going to say your products suck, they don't work. <laughs> when it's not, the, no, nothing is going to work if you don't work it. Mm-hmm. It's like if someone goes and buys some crafts and these tools and visualizes a deck, there isn't a deck that just manifests in their backyard. They have to actually buy the lumber and buy the nails and buy the what, all the components that are necessary and build the fucking deck. Well, I saw the this t- movie called The Secret that said otherwise. Well, yes, with The Secret <laughs> that you're supposed to just have the power of positive thinking and everything will work out. But, okay, if you don't believe you can build a fucking deck, you never will. So the opposite of The Secret is definitely true. Definitely. I think <laughs> that the secret is marketed towards the poor me, victim mentality, I'm a loser people. That think that they have no capacity to succeed at anything because they're a loser. And that if you try to teach those people to think positive, they'll think less negative. So rather than having a placebo effect, they'll cancel out their nocebo effect. Hmm, that makes sense. You know, like there's an anabolic steroid called DECA, right? fucking amazing. Everyone thinks it gives impotence because they take it with testosterone and when you mix the two of them together you get a ton of estrogen. The estrogen causes prolactin to be released and the prolactin causes impotence. So what happens is all these fucktards, they go out and they take DECA and immediately before it ever has a chance to work, they're like, oh my god I've got impotence. I've got DECA dick. It's like, no you fucking piece of shit. You just have a nocebo effect because you read a bunch of side effects on the internet and you imagine you have one, and you gave it to yourself. It's like, let me ask you this. <sighs> Were you thinking about, oh, my God, my dick isn't going to work the entire time? You're like, yeah. I was like, right. So you're busy thinking about your dick not working, not thinking about how good the pussy feels. It ain't going to stay hard. And then they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Mm-hmm. Whereas the types of people that don't read shit on the Internet, they never have that problem. Because they don't have the nocebo effect. It's an example of nocebo. Both groups are going to have constipation and diarrhea and an obstetic, upset stomach and headache. Because that's how many fucking hypochondriacs are out there. And if you give them a pill, they stress themselves out enough to where they get a IBS <laughs> or headache. So every medication, every fucking medication has upset stomach, constipation, diarrhea, because obviously something can't cause both constipation and diarrhea. That's like going north and south at the same time. Mm-hmm. So it's clearly the, it's the way their stress response is, is all that you're really measuring. I got Oh, I noticed one of your supplements had a mitochondria formula. What's that all about? Oh, Wrath of the Valkyrie. So I can go over the exact ingredients if you want. That's the one. I wanted to hear if you have any thoughts about mitochondrial biogenesis. Oh, I don't remember what the mitochondrial complex of Wrath of the Valkyrie is. You want me to read it to you? Yeah. Uh, Teacrine, caffeine, 3, 5, diido, L, thyroidine. T2, yeah, that's just a fancy name for T2, so okay. it doesn't get mixed with T3. T3 is active thyroid hormone, right? T4 is inactive. Okay. It gets activated to T3. T3 speeds up mitochondrial function. T2 works like an uncoupler, and it basically causes a heat sink, whereas normally you would get 9 calories per gram of fat oxidized um, from 1 gram of fat turns into 9 calories, right? With T2 or a different uncoupler known as DNP, which is really lethal, it can decrease the amount of calories you get per gram of fat. So uncoupler proteins are also found, I think, with brown fat. So the point is, is that with by using T2, I can make fat burning less efficient. And so you end up wasting a lot of energy as heat. So that's not great. It's fantastic because I limited the amount that's in this product. Now, in a previous product, which was just called T2 with a previous company I owned and I designed the product for, I gave very clear instructions on how to take it, but it was a liquid. And what I didn't expect is everyone, even people in the office or the lab, the other the people, the girls who did the computer programming, they all drank from the bottle. 
So they're supposed to have 0.3 milliliters. So they're drinking two, three, four milliliters multiple times a day. People were losing so much fat off of it. It was incredible. And I thought, this isn't right, that these people don't deserve to lose fat. So, because if you don't work out, you don't deserve anything. That you can't just buy a $15 bottle of something and lose 20 pounds. That's not fair. So, you know, it was selling like crazy, but I'm like, the amount of T2 you take in, the body's going to make less T4. So if they're abusing the fuck out of it, there would be a point eventually that they would stop making T4, and so they would have no T3, and then they would have health consequences from not having T3. And so Hold on, and the fat burning is because the body's producing extra heat, which is coming from energy, which it's getting from fat. Right. So rather than, this is like an engine that makes too much noise and gets worse gas mileage. Right? There's a, all machines have an efficiency. Mitochondria have an efficiency. I was turning down the mitochondrial efficiency, which would be stimulating more fat burning to get the same amount of calories. So it doesn't increase your metabolism. I do that with other ingredients. What it does is it decreases the amount of efficiency when making those calories from your food calories. Which makes it causes more burn. Right. And uh, so the caffeine indirectly speeds up the function of the mitochondria. And also the teacrine increases the sensitivity of the caffeine and it works at a double potency form of caffeine that you don't build up a tolerance to. So I was able to use way less caffeine and maximize the efficiency of the caffeine and, and then I could decrease the efficiency of the mitochondria with the T2. And since I'm not using T3, this doesn't prohibit someone from taking T3, which is a very normal bodybuilding drug to take when you want to lose more fat. How does uh, T3 play into bodybuilding? It increases the speed of the mitochondria. Okay. You already said so, that. well, yeah, I mean, but it's complicated. Because um, I was not aware that the thyroid was playing a role in all this. Huge. So most of these, if you ever notice the bikini competitors, if you ever meet one, they'll say, yeah, I competed for two years, then my coach fucked up my thyroid and I can't compete anymore. That's probably not the truth. Probably she insisted on taking T3, and he told her take like 10 milligrams, micrograms of T3, and she took 50 or 100, immediately stopped taking it the minute she walked off stage and started drinking like a fish and eating like a pig and gained 20 to 30 pounds back instantly. Now, I know that would happen, so I've never let girls use T3 that would, would either have to walk and work with someone else, or they can do it my way and do it drug free. It's not because I don't believe in drugs. It's because I know that people aren't responsible when they use them, so I don't ever help them with drugs that they're not going to be responsible with. That I don't run into that problem with men. Men might double the dose. No matter what you tell them, they might use double. But I've ran into that problem with women where they don't even look to see what the milligram of the drug is. They count the drug as pills. So, like, how many, you know, you're supposed to take five milligrams of Anavar, right? And you don't know how much they're taking because they say, I take a pill. Well, what milligram is the pill? I don't know what milligram is, is what they'll say. So, you don't know how much they're actually taking. Because there's 50 milligram pills, there's 10 milligram pills, there's five pills. And if you explain to them, okay, you're taking this one, that's 50. That's like if you took 10 of the ones I want you to take. And then they'll just get mad and start yelling. So there's no point in trying. So I just don't ever bother trying to handle that part of the sport with girls. And they're the ones who tend to abuse the fuck out of T3 and burn out their thyroid. And then they, they quit the sport after two years and then they blow up and they get super fat and they go around and they blame their coach for everything when really they don't take any accountability. Like I drank alcohol and I ate junk food. That's how I gained the fat. That no one... People don't believe that their thyroid has very little to do with their body fat. Right. It's that as you gain body fat, estrogen increases. Estrogen causes the thyroid to stop working. So they go to the doctor and they're like, I think there's something wrong with my thyroid. I'm really fat. And it's like, the problem is your thyroid's not working because you're fat. It's not that you're fat because your thyroid's not working. Okay. So what does the doctor do? He puts them on thyroid medication, 
but the thyroid medication makes their thyroid stop working. So now they have to be on thyroid medication for life. Correct. And then they're depressed because they're fat, so they get put on an antidepressant. But the antidepressant makes and their that, sex drive... And leads to weight gain. <laughs> which leads to weight gain. So their, their sex drive goes away, so now they're not getting laid, so they're even more upset, and their boyfriend leaves them. So now they're even more depressed, so they eat more junk food and they get even fatter. Fat makes estrogen, and estrogen makes you fatter, sadder, more anxious, and makes your thyroid stop working, so you get even fatter. So the important thing is to reduce body fat at all costs, and you will be less estrogenic, and your quality of life will improve. Right, and honestly, that's one of the biggest markers of all kinds of disease, is having too much body fat. In every situation. In fact, like Dr. Lane Norton, he pointed out that almost all of these diets, whether it's keto, carnivore, vegan, or intermittent fasting, the vast majority of the data supports health benefits is still not beyond the health benefits that affect the person who lost weight. That the amount of health benefits you get from losing 10 pounds of fat is the same as losing 10 pounds of fat from intermittent fasting, Losing fat from 10 pounds of veganism, 10 pounds of fat from carnivore, 10 pounds of fat from keto, 10 pounds of fat from paleo. All of the benefits are really just coming down to they're eating less calories because they're restricting their intake. Well, speaking of fat here, what's the distinction between brown fat and white fat? White fat is just storage. It's useless. Brown fat is actively functions to burn more fat because it has those encoupler proteins that decreases the efficiency of the mitochondria burning fat for fuel. So brown fat has mitochondria in it. That's why it's brown. And it uses white fat for fuel. That's the simplest way to do it. And people will say, well, brown fat's not found in humans. It's not found in you, but <laughs> I have brown fat. You know, the way, that, the way that you develop brown fat, to my understanding, is things like hit cardio and high-intense exercise. And so, um, cold exposure. That makes sense, too. Yeah, I could see that. So, like, um, the Wim Hof lifestyle would probably develop extra brown fat. And but, uh, speaking of cold exposure, though, that's also one of the ways I know to create more mitochondria. Which would stimulates make Stimulates mitochondrial yeah. biogenesis. So you mentioned mitochondrial biogenesis is the growth or recession of the quantity of mitochondria to meet the demands or needs that you have. So working really fucking hard, you're going to need a lot of energy. So you can build up the ability to have physical endurance over time. Like, for instance, an example would be you could take someone who's a power lifter and can do one rep bench for 600 pounds. He might be stronger than me at a one rep bench. But if we do chest for two hours, is he going to be able to bench as much as me for a set of 10 after two hours? Probably not, because I developed a lot more muscular endurance. And muscular endurance is a bigger factor for muscle size than how strong you are. It's, it's all much more complicated than that. But ultimately, developing muscular endurance develops more carnosine, and that regenerates some of the muscle energy that you need. So I think, and I'm not sure, the ingredient Bennett alanine increases carnosine, and carnosine can regenerate ATP as it's attached to creatine. So it, re, it makes creatine into creatine phosphate, and creatine phosphate is used to donate a phosphate to increase your reps in the 6 to 10 range. Now, the 6 to 10 range is the myofibular growth range, basically the range that develops both strength and size of the muscle. So most bodybuilders want to train their upper body in a 6 to 10 rep range and their lower body in an 8 to 12 rep range. That's the most efficient way to train. Carnosine helps with that. Creatine helps with that. So beta, supplementing with beta alanine and creatine helps with that. That's why all pre-workouts have beta alanine. And, and uh, creatine and carnosine are also foods not re or nutrients not really found in plant sources. Is that correct? I mean, it wouldn't be called carnosine <laughs> if it was if it from was the Latin, Latin meaning flesh. Yeah. Or meat. So, so 
I mean, it's important to just do it right and not try to reinvent the wheel. But hold on. Fact, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry to interrupt you. What were you going to say? I was going to make sure I'm getting, I'm hearing this right. The way I'm understanding it basically is that the more you use the muscle, the more you're forcing your muscles to work, the more need there is for mitochondria, so the body will respond by producing it. Right. And the harder you're working, the more you're going to need energy, so the more mitochondria from brown fat. Now, and hold so on. When you're working your muscle really hard that way, doesn't the mitochondria um, choose an alternative metabolism pathway uh, to tur turning glycogen into lactic acid? Not quite. Okay, so the, when we're in a 6 to 10 rep range, we're using white muscle fibers, which are glycolytic fibers. That's where the lactic acid comes from. If the reps go beyond 60 seconds, if you're doing so many reps that your set lasts more than 60 seconds, you're converting to an endurance pathway. That's when it uses the red muscle fibers, and it uses mitochondria, fat, and oxygen. So that's why doing HIIT cardio is the best of both worlds because you get to stimulate the brown fat mitochondria. Because the muscular mitochondria won't get activated during high intensity training. High intensity is so heavy that you won't hit an endurance threshold. You'll conk out before that. But your body will still get low in blood nutrient levels. That's why the brown fat will start activating. So you can't use muscular mitochondria because they're in different muscle fibers than the ones you're using. Usually, once the white fibers quit, the brown fibers will kick in to help out a little bit, but it's not going to be very good. Usually, if you crank out, let's say, 10 great reps, and the 11th one's slow as fuck, that 11th one is the slow twitch, the red fibers kicking in. Yeah, Remember how uh, you mentioned that the, um, the white the chicken breast has vitamin Bs, but the chicken thighs have different nutrients? Correct. Dark meat? are type 1 fibers. They're the ones with the mitochondria. That's why they're dark. The white, the white meat has no mitochondria, and thus it has no fat because the fat's fueled for the mitochondria. It uses just carbohydrates for the, prep, for the um, glycolysis. Okay. Since you have no mitochondria, you have no prep cycle. Since you have no prep cycle, you have no fat. That makes a lot of sense. That's why you would use... That's why people say you use chicken breasts for sprinting and chicken thighs for endurance athletes is because they need the fat and the mitochondria to make intramuscular fat and mitochondria. Right. So if you had a bunch of fancy vegans telling you how to eat, people just thought, hey, we had red fiber in our legs, so we're going to run for a long time, so let's eat chicken legs. You know, because that we're going to take their legs and make it into our legs. All right, and that's back to the idea that the animal's part's going to have the corresponding nutrition for the human part. Right, and that the mitochondrial um, electron transport chain with NAD and NADPH and coenzyme Q10 and all that shit, it doesn't evaporate. Right. If you, if you fucking if, eat it, it's still in your body. If you want to go and eat it. If I think... Like, when I think about feeding my mitochondria, I want to eat the most mitochondria-rich tissue, which, by the way, it might be heart. A lot of women are pissed off because I've got four ounces of red meat a day on their diet, and they're like, I don't want to eat red meat. It's bad for you. I'm like, are you cold right now? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, why do you think you're cold? It's like, I don't know. I'm a girl. And it's like, because you're anemic, because you don't eat any fucking red meat, so you have no iron. You have you, iron deficiency anemia. Do you know of any... Like, oh. Direct evidence that even suggests that red meat is actually bad. What I found is the dumb of the person, <laughs> the harder it is for you to convince them what they know is false. You have to work with their limited and broken knowledge base to turn it against them. So you accept their bullshit is true, and you still prove them wrong with their own bullshit. <laughs> it's like in jujitsu when you strangle so someone with their own gi. Rather than trying to take their gi off, just take their gi and strangle them with it, and they'll take it off themselves before they see you again. Or like Tai Chi when you're just 
redirecting someone's energy back at them. That sort of thing. Right. So it's like, I, I don't want to eat red meat because it'll give me cancer. It's like, okay, but you don't have any iron. because you. Oh, yeah, my doctor said I was iron deficient. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you're iron deficient because you don't drink any blood. Well, hold on. Let me you ask you this. Blood, oh. You can't grow blood because you don't have iron because you're not drinking blood. You can't just take iron filings and absorb it. They're like, well, you can mix it with vitamin C. It's like, but you can't absorb vitamin C either. <laughs> you just get diarrhea from the vitamin C, and now you don't absorb any of your food. Well, if you're talking about vitamin C from a supplement. Right, that's my point. It's they'll take an iron pill and a vitamin C right. pill. And they're like, oh, now I've got the same thing as eating beef and a tangerine. And no, not, no, neither no, of those are bioavailable. Thing. They're right. not. They're, they're not, not in what, what we were, were talking about, about. The active forms that the body is able to assimilate and use. And Correct. Use. And so what I do is I put the vitamin C in the intra-workout product so that it cleans up their um, free radical damage from the training. Yeah, right. I was going to ask you. Um, you have that as a calcium ascorbate form. Is that correct? I okay. So that would be what the. Um, biochemical engineers have to do is to make the stuff into an actual powder that doesn't turn into some slime when it hits Florida to temperatures. Mm -hmm. You know, when you manufacture shit, you have to, it's got to taste good. It's got to look the same every time someone opens it. Otherwise they think there's something wrong. If the lab uses the wrong amount of blue coloring, I get all these messages like my Thor's hammer isn't as blue as it used to be. <laughs> Is it going to work right? I was like, you're asking me if it's got less food coloring? <laughs> and they're like, when you put it that way, it feels like you're stupid. It's like, don't you formulate this shit in your head before you manage to reach out to somebody? It's like, but, it's um, like the reason I was asking is, do you think it is that makes it blue? You know, right. <laughs> what you really do we skimp on that it's not blue enough for you? <laughs> but isn't the ascorbate form, um, the active form that's found in animal bodies as opposed to the ascorbate, um, Ascorbic acid. The ascorbate versus ascorbic acid, which is in most supplements. Because ascorbic acid will be ascorbate once it donates a proton. Okay. So if you put ascorbate in stomach acid, it's going to get protonated because the pH of the stomach is so much lower than a racemic base. And that means there's extra protons. Well, it would basically, a proton is a hydrogen molecule. And that, but that's. But that's, that's what's that's determining pH, pH, correct? Is having right. okay. So your stomach acid is made of hydrochloric acid, right? So when you use more salt, for instance, your stomach acid will go down because you've got more chlorine relative to the amount of protons, and which is hydrogen, and it'll just rebind and it'll become hydrochloric acid again. So if something goes from an acid to an eight when it donates that proton. Okay. So it's where big acid still has the hydrogen attached. Ah, okay. That makes so sense. So if you use ascorbic a ascorbate a instead of ascorbic acid, then as soon as it hits the stomach, which it will because you're drinking it, then the hydrochloric acid in your stomach is just going to reprotonate it and convert it back into its acidic form. Okay. Then, based on what's in your stomach is how much um, bile secretions you'll have that will come from the liver, go through the gallbladder, go through – the um, sphincter, the ampulla of Vader in the pancreas, mix with your digestive proteases from your pancreas and then inject through the sphincter of OD into the duodenum. And that will change the pH of the chyme that comes out of your stomach into the duodenum. And the, it'll be perfect to allow it to be deacidified enough to where it won't melt the lining of your intestines when you're digesting it. So we don't really have to regulate right, the okay. food because the body should take care of that if you're healthy. Okay, that makes sense. Um, you know, when someone doesn't have a gallbladder, they don't really absorb fats very well. So they're going to get steatorrhea, which is like shitty diarrhea, I mean, um, fatty diarrhea. And it's going to fuck up all their absorption if they eat fat. So like, if they have no gallbladder, they have to really reduce the amount of fat in their diet. Right. But by not having fat in your stomach, it doesn't t tell your liver how much of what enzymes. Like I think it's cholecystokinin is the one that um, decreases or re increases the pH of the chyme when it comes out of the stomach. So 
having meals that are pure acid and car um, pure protein and carbs are so acidic that you don't absorb them. But the real truth is the reason isn't that the fat that you have with the meal is basic, is that it causes the liver through the gallbladder, through the um, pancreas to release the proper stuff to um, neutralize that acid so that it can be absorbed better. So five to 10 grams of fat per meal really helps with digestion in most people. Um, I want to back up for a minute though, because you were talking about mitochondria, you mentioned cancer, and I wanted to ask you if you're familiar with the work of Dr. Otto Warburg and like the metabolic cancer as a metabolic disease, this type of thing. Uh, okay, I mean, there's the work. There's a work. Um, the book is by Dr. Seyfried, who's really building off of Otto Warburg, who did it in the '40s. Basically, the idea is that cancer occurs when cells can no longer metabolize energy through the mitochondria and oxidative phosphorylation, which makes it turn to the lactic acid pathway, and that's quite literally what defines a cancer cell the inability of the mitochondria to work. Of course, this ties in with um, the nutrients needed to complete the electron transport chain, because without those, the mitochondria doesn't work. I mean, it sounds all fun and dandy, but that's not the acogenic model that I'm familiar with. That the DNA gets damaged, and there's mismatch repair, and, if, and the cell starts doing things it's not supposed to do, and comes a neoplasm which has absolutely nothing to do with the mitochondria whatsoever. That is, it's pretty clearly defined on the oncogenesis of cancer cells and what it takes to cause a cell to turn into a cancer cell and how cancer cells are different, like the telomeres. You know, like one of the things it'll do is it'll express receptors that it wouldn't normally express to get stimulated by things it wouldn't normally get stimulated by. And that teaches it to grow. And it behaves kind of like, if you ever watch a zombie movie, the way the zombie virus just, the individual vi zombies don't seem that smart, but the way that the zombie virus spreads to a population is so brilliant, it almost gives them a level of intelligence to the virus itself. It's absolutely awesome how evil and destructive cancer cells are and how efficient and incredible they are at growing and morphing into something that's unkillable and, and develops new powers, basically. Uh, essentially, they're immortal. But the concept that in order to well, be a cancer cell, the most efficient form of energy functioning has to be disrupted is almost the most contraintuitive thing I've ever heard. Well, how are anything that they would get more mitochondria because it would allow it to grow even faster. How are those cells metabolizing it? Because not all cells have mitochondria. That's true, but um, what cells don't have mitochondria? Uh, fat cells, white fat cells don't have mitochondria. What white cells? muscle cells don't have uh, mitochondria. Um, blood cells don't have mitochondria, which none of those actually convert into cancers. But that goes to show that if you don't have the ability to produce energy, you're not going to grow. Um, well, uh, Certain um, brain cells don't have uh, mitochondria, but most of your skeletal muscle and bone, like the cells that do develop like breast tissue, those have, those grow because of estrogen receptors. The uterus grows because of estrogen receptors. Bladder cancer, liver cancer, those will have probably mitochondria. But I don't think that the loss of the ability to produce energy would result in um, cancer. Now, one thing I will say is that when you go on a keto diet, you take away the carbohydrate source of fuel and that you pretty much need carbohydrates for cancer cells to grow. Cancer cells can't grow without ca um, carbohydrates, which does support your but, point about the glycolysis and the lactic acid pathway. Right, and that's specifically because that they're fermenting sugar into lactic acid rather than using oxidative phosphorylation. But I will admit that there's different types of cancers and they're not all exactly the same, so I'm not yes, trying to say, say this across the board. 
it does make sense that if there is a cancer cell that has no mitochondria and you remove all carbohydrates from the diet, it shouldn't be able to keep growing or it certainly would slow its rate of growth. I don't think it makes sense that a cell losing its mitochondria makes it cancerous. So I think that they're looking at it from a backwards perspective, that they're concluding it's a mitochondrial dysfunction because a sugar-free diet really diminishes the growth of cancer, and they're incorrectly concluding it's due to a lack of mitochondria. But then again, I'm just basing this off of theory. And, and, I, doc- and I want to say that I might not have this exactly right also. So. <laughs> I would think that if this doctor was published and people believe in him, then the chances are that his research is a lot more intelligent than I'm giving it credit. Or that I'm making it sound. Or, so I probably should know what I'm talking about before I shoot him in the face on a podcast about it. But I will say that there is the, the concept that cancer can't grow without sugar would suggest that the mitochondria in cancer cells are not functioning. That does support his that theory. And I know uh, so like the glioblastomas in the brain seem to respond to ketones, that when the brain uh, gets ketones instead of sugar as its metabolism source, that some of those cancers it seems to be very beneficial. That the most efficient use of a keto diet for cancer is brain cancer. And of course, not all brain cancers are the same. There's like eight different types. Correct. And I used to know this shit really well when I used to write diets for people with cancer. I haven't done a keto diet for cancer in like seven years. So I don't have it memorized right now. Fair enough. But I have done it before. Brain cancer diets and um, breast cancer diets. And I did manage to get 100% remission out of one breast cancer diet. Do you have any um, details about that diet that you want to share? It was just a keto diet. And I remember the woman was eating sweet potatoes. I was like, why would you eat sweet potatoes if you're on a keto diet? Well, you eat sweet potatoes. But you have <laughs> breast cancer. People think it's funny. To me, it's just fucking sad. Like, how fucking dumb are you that you're going to think that you can eat whatever I eat after you bought a special diet just for you and your breast cancer? It's like, how bad do you want to live? <laughs> like, why are you cheating on your diet? It's life or death metaphoric life or death like a fat person would be. This is like literal life and death, like you have cancer. Well, when they're uh, giving out candy after chemotherapy, (laughs) sweet potato doesn't seem so bad. Well, because they don't want you to live. They want you to be they want you to be sick forever. You know, how else would they get all your money? Right, exactly. And people don't really get, well, now people get it. Like 10 years ago, they thought I was crazy. Now people really believe me. They're like, all right, I'd rather go with the Han Solo doctor that doesn't want me to take a bunch of pills and isn't going to make any money off me than go with the doctor who looks like a Nazi in his like very pristine coat and his clipboard and his glasses that's going to experiment on me for profit. It used to not be seen that way, but now that's the only real benefit I've seen from this massive shift to the left is the distrust of the medical well, it, it seems to me that at this point, uh, they have a very long history of a bad track record at helping anybody with any chronic condition. Right. But so most people don't realize that. They why, think that if they take a pill, it cancels out their bad lifestyle choices. The dumbest fucking shit I've ever heard. And, um, you know, each one of those pills is made out of petroleum-based chemicals. And they're specifically designed to disrupt bodily processes. Yeah, I know. And what's so funny is you try to teach a doctor about the shit you do in order to make yourself more powerful, and they're blown away. Their concept is so primitive, they think that testosterone is all there is to it. They think that testosterone plus growth hormone is the extent of the anabolic matrix and that there's all other anabolic steroids are just different street names for testosterone. They don't understand the different compounds. Well, let's uh, let's go there into a little detail because these are things that I would like to know more about, uh, especially the different androgens that I am unfamiliar with and their role. All right.
right? So ultimately, all anabolic steroids are based off of the concept that testosterone does certain things. And what testosterone is, is a pro-hormone that converts to estrogen, the female hormone, or DHT. Now, estrogen's terrible for you. It's fucking horrible. And almost every side effect people think is from steroids is just from estrogen. From the, except, uh, from the metabolizing of the androgens so, into yeah, estrogen. The te- testosterone itself, if it was never to convert to DHT and never convert to estrogen, would be a very mild but safe anabolic agent. But that is impossible. It will definitely convert to one or the other. You can try to stop the enzymes to do that conversion, but you need those enzymes to convert other things in your body. Are those aromatase inhibitors? Aromatase inhibitors would block the aromatase enzyme, and that's what converts testosterone to estrogen. But uh, aromatase itself does other things in the body known as a different name. I think it's called CYP2A2 on the actual indexing of all the liver enzymes, and that other people, other groups, other branches of medicine know that enzyme to do different things, but the en- reproductive endocrinologists do not. And so a lot of the reproductive endocrinologists are like gynecologists, and they don't, and they're not endocrinologists, so they don't really get anything besides female reproductive endocrinology. So you really don't want to crush and destroy the aromatase enzyme, but you do want to nearly obliterate estrogen. So, like, for instance, in Thor's hammer, it just happened to have it sitting on next to me, I have the 7-8-benzo, which is a 50% suicide inhibitor. So it doesn't just block the aromatase enzyme, it destroys about 50% of it in your body. So for a long time after you stop taking it, your body will just make less estrogen out of available testosterone, making testosterone shifted towards the male end of the spectrum, which is why people take it. No one's taking testosterone because they want to be more feminine. Correct. So... Um, the other byproduct, the other hormone that's downstream of testosterone is DHT. And DHT would be great, except for one, it doesn't build any muscle. Two, it causes baldness. And three, it causes aggression. So it's not good. Because it basically is extremely aggressive alpha male personality changes. But it causes you to lose your hair. And people think it causes prostate cancer, but it doesn't directly. SHBG, which is steroid hormone binding globulin, mm-hmm. complexes with estrogen, okay. binds to the prostate, and then makes the prostate very receptive to DHT. So that those that complex plus DHT then results in prostate cancer. So if you really just control or erase the estrogen, you will lose SHBG and prolactin, and then therefore you won't get the prostate cancer from the DHT. Um. So... That's how testosterone, now testosterone has, testosterone binds to the androgen receptor. Now, the complex can have effects inside the cell. It can also have effects on the nucleus, causing transcription and translation to uh, muscle protein synthesis. So you don't even have to bind that complex to the nucleus for it to have effects on the AKT pathway of muscle protein synthesis. There's even benefits of having testosterone that doesn't bind to the receptor, and there's benefits of the receptor that doesn't have to do with binding testosterone. So there's that androgen receptor by itself, unbound, has actually got anabolic potential. You're talking about having free testosterone in the blood? For the most part, yeah. I mean, because it doesn't, it may not actually stay in the blood, because the testosterone has a 60% binding affinity to the aldosterone receptor on the kidneys. And estrogen has some binding to the androgen receptor. So really, nothing is 100% binding. What really matters is something's binding efficiency. Mm -hmm. The stronger any hormone binds to its receptor, the stronger the effect. If you have a low binding affinity, you might get an opposite effect. So for instance, tamoxifen, which is a breast cancer medication, has a, it's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. In other meaning, it binds to some estrogen receptors in some tissues and has the opposite effect of what estrogen would do. Like it binds to the brain and it causes your body to make more LH, which means your testes make more.
more testosterone rather than estrogen when it binds to the brain it causes your te- brain to make less LH. What's and LH? Luteinizing hormone. Okay. So, <laughs> well, okay, so gonadotropin releasing hormone binds to the pituitary and the pituitary releases LH and FSH. LH binds to the Leydig cells and the Leydig cells produce testosterone that goes into your bloodstream and also some of it laterally binds to the Sertoli cells where FSH binds and that causes sperm to be produced. So most of the time when someone goes to a reproductive endocrinologist, those reproductive endocrinologists fail to accomplish the goal. They don't actually make a man fertile again. I have been able to give people Thor's hammer and switch what they're taking from um, what's uh, I forgot the name of it. It's not citrulline, but it's but to a different serum called tamoxifen. And tamoxifen plus Thor's hammer has managed to get at least three couples pregnant that I know of, probably more than that. But three people in the metro Detroit area that have actually introduced me to the baby that they had by listening to me after their team at University of Michigan failed. So extrapolate that to the other 50 states, and it's effective for what it's supposed to do, which is turning the testicles back on and inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to estrogen. It doesn't inhibit the conversion of DHT because most of the reason why people take testosterone supplements is to be more masculine. And you're not going to have some avalanche of testosterone that the body tries to clear up all this extra testosterone by converting an excessive amount of DHT. What al- the, the alternative is, and this is where doctors fuck up their patients, just like they fuck up women with thyroid medication, is they prescribe testosterone sipinate, which is not testosterone. That's where people get fucked up. They all, every steroid user uses testosterone injections with their anabolic steroids because they think it's good for them to have some natural test. It ain't natural test. It's a drug called testosterone that is not the same chemical structure as testosterone. Well, if it were, it's, they wouldn't be able to patent it, right? Right, but it's so fucking funny that all these idiots say test is best and you got to use testosterone or you won't have any because they think that the testosterone hormone has a testosterone receptor and that the nandrolone hormone has a nandrolone receptor and the anadrol hormone has an anadrol receptor. Not true. There's one receptor, the androgen receptor, and certain synthetic androgen binders are better than others. And one of the worst ones is testosterone because it's super weak and it converts to estrogen. Now, the stuff you inject converts to estrogen way more than the stuff your testicles make. And that's so what you don't want. Right, which is horrible because you're going to get more feminine than you are masculine. So people are taking these injections to be more manly. They're like, maybe my wife will fuck me again if I'm more manly. And then they take this and they become more feminine, which they get pimples, they get moody, is, they get anxiety. Is that why you hear wild. that um, your balls might shrink? The ball shrinking is from the testes no longer making testosterone. Ah. So they get the signal from the brain. Right. The estrogen's binding to the brain telling it to stop and make testosterone. And you're putting synthetic into your blood, which... Right. It's synthetic testosterone that works worse than the real thing. No. It's almost like doctors use it to castrate their patients and make them weak and needy so they can be less healthy and they can sell them other pills. Sounds all right. Now, mandrolone is a progesterone molecule but it doesn't bind to the progesterone receptor. It binds to the androgen receptor and it stimulates the androgen receptor like two and a half times as strong as testosterone. So it's much better at building muscle. It doesn't convert to DHT and it doesn't convert to estrogen in any real amount. So it has no side effects. It has all benefits. The problem is everyone takes it with testosterone. And since it all binds to the testosterone receptor, then the already shitty testosterone sipinate gets converted to estrogen at an even higher rate. Okay. And then the estrogen levels go so high that prolactin is released, and the prolactin causes impotence. And so then everyone says that you get DECA dick or impotence with DECA 
but it's not from DECA. It's from adding DECA to test. And then the testosterone is taking up the receptor space that you actually want. No, the deck is on the t receptor stage that you want, so the testosterone has nothing to do but bind to aromatase. Okay. And then the aromatase converts testosterone to estrogen. And, Where, uh, and, mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about uh, the precursors to testosterone and how the body makes it. Okay, so cholesterol is converted to DHEA in the adrenal gland, and cholesterol is converted to testosterone directly in the testes. And vitamin D is a transporter for that. Vitamin D also upregulates the androgen receptor, quantity. So it's kind of silly to take a bunch of keys if you don't have enough locks for all the keys. You always want to have more locks than keys. Because if there's more keys than locks, the body's going to scavenge those keys and convert them to estrogen. And the key is the hormone, the lock is the receptor? Correct. In all, um, in all endocrinology, that's the analogy that's used. Because most people don't get terms like ligand and the receptor, but they get ideas of locks and keys. And that when you turn the key in the right key in the right lock, you activate gene synthesis. You know, I kind of I see the body. What's going on? It's kind of like this crazy game of mousetrap, where you have like three dimensional puzzle pieces that come together, which causes a signal, which causes more three dimensional signal er, building blocks to come together, which releases some free radicals, which causes something else to happen. It's like this whole cascade of, of biological events. It's extremely complicated. One cell is more complicated than almost a city. There's like trillions of things going, like, we, we don't even, we barely even scratch the surface of what's going on, like, scientifically. Inner space is as complex and as fascinating as outer space. That being a molecular biochemist would be just as exciting as being an astronaut on the um, Starship Enterprise. I agree. And, um... and, and so the alien species, you've got new plant-based proteins you can introduce. Because all the animal-based proteins our bodies are ready for, they've read, they're not alien. But, but plant-based proteins are totally alien to us. Or insect hormones. A lot of the... For, a while because pro hormones were banned everyone was using insect hormones to try to stimulate muscle growth and shit like that or plant based hormones to stimulate muscle growth well, and nothing more good as better as um you know i've pre studied herbalism a long time and it's kind of the same concept where these are chemicals the plants are making for their own immune system their own protection and we kind of hijack that when we eat them and get the same effect in our own body as it changes the way this game of mousetrap is happening and alters these events that are really playing out as biology. Right. Taking a free-form leucine amino acid and spiking mTOR, forcing your body to make protein it doesn't want. Just a total dick move. <laughs> so there being a... Um, a consequence to overstimulation of mTOR is perfectly rational, but that doesn't mean I know what that is. And I know the consequence of having some excessive mTOR activation is you win the Olympia and you get 400 grand, then it's like, that's definitely worth it. That's a good side effect. <laughs> because I know a lot of these Mr. Olympias, and they sure look better at 60 and 50 than any other 60 and 50 year olds. Certainly better than football players, basketball players, or the doctors who are talking shit about them. But have you seen Arnold lately? Because that guy does not look good. I think Arnold looks good at 70 or something. <laughs> Maybe. He's doing movies. Yeah. Last time I saw yeah. him, he uh, didn't look so hot to me. But it's been a while since I've seen him. He switched to vegan. Well, that's probably his problem. Yeah, I mean, he switched to uh, vegan. And was he like, in the Game Changers? Yeah. Oh, uh, I, I haven't seen it, so. Yeah, that, that's James Cameron made Game Changers. Because game, oh. James Cameron okay. bought a piece. And he's so James Cameron, Terminator. He is the best form of um, plant-based protein. Right. So he bought like a 40% of the pea farms on the planet or something astronomical like that. Yeah. Then made game changers so that people will go towards plant-based diets because one way or another, they're going to need his pea protein. <laughs> because if you're so vegan, really, game you Game changing is really some subconscious commercial. And he got the Terminator, Arnold Schwarzenegger, to go back on a meat diet and go towards vegan 
so that we got the most macho man that the world's ever known endorsing this thing. It's like, you don't have to be a pussy and be a vegan. Look how strong this guy is. Even Arnold eats vegan. Yeah. You know, look at these pro football players. But we know we're not going to appeal to you just by putting down your masculinity or building it up. We're going to show you fake science. Like, look at how fat this person's blood is because they ate a bunch of fat. <laughs> you know, give him some time and I'll be back on a meat-based diet. <laughs> if you don't know what's going on in that dude's body and what he needs right now to achieve whatever goal he wants to achieve. You know, Dorian Yates is doing all DMT and yoga and bicycling. Because he's master bodybuilding. He's the world's first person to ever unlock the most knowledge about human physique and revolutionized diet and training. And he's never been the same since. He's like, what am I going to do next? Because I'm going to take a bunch of mind-altering drugs and go for biking. Going to start becoming a (laughs) psychonaut. Yeah. So, well, no, but Dorian is one of the first people to admit this DMT thing that was famous. And on that Joe Rogan podcast from like five or six years ago, when he talked about DMT, it's like, okay, you're basically astrally projecting or astrally perceiving that you're able to enter a dimensional space that's collectively shared with emotions where someone with negative energy, you can see negative energy dripping off of them. Someone with positive energy, you can see positive energy dripping off of them. Now, um, was he smoking DMT or is he doing ayahuasca? I don't know. Yeah. But if you check it out, it's Joe Rogan's podcast, 989 Dorian Yates. And it's towards the end of it. Okay. And it is mind-blowing. Because for me to take someone who's as serious and brutal as fuck as Dorian Yates, and hear he used a psychedelic drug to have a vision quest, and he's describing shit out of RPGs that he would never know because he's never played an RPG, <laughs> that it would really imply there's some validity to it. Whoa. Having some regular old pothead tell me about, dude, whoa, like, I could see vibes, man. I wouldn't take him seriously. But this dude is serious as fuck. Well, you know, this is, before we started recording, we were kind of getting into this area about the true nature of reality. And DMT is definitely one of those things that seems to allow more perception of what's actually happening in the physical world than we are able to get without it. Like, when... like You can perceive the spirit plane. I Basically. But, like, I'm seeing you now. I'm not actually seeing you. I'm seeing light that is... Well, if we were in the same room, it would be reflecting off of you, going into my eyes, which are actually receivers for a small set of frequencies, which is then interpreted by the brain and played back as a holographic image by the mind. Correct. But but, Three seconds, kind of one second delay. And upside down, like, flipped. And that's perceived (laughs) by your conscience. So the way you perceive me is literally different than your identical twin would if he grew up in a prison death camp or something like that, or grew up on an island never seen TV, that you're basically absorbing a very narrow amount of electromagnetic spectrum, not including infrared, not including ultraviolet. You're not picking up any of the other signals, and my emotional aura isn't perceivable to you, but it is to other people who are psychically sensitive. And my understanding is with DMT, you can now perceive auras the way other people would. Obviously, it's going to look different I was talking to a gypsy girl who didn't know about chakras, but her interpretation of auras sounded like she could just see someone's primary chakra. That she said yellow people are really strong-willed and (laughs) blue people are really um, good talkers and yellow people are kind of creepy. And I was like, yellow people are the materialistic ones. And she goes, that makes sense, actually. Are not yellow, orange people are materialistic. So she saw auras based off someone's nature, but she didn't know she was actually seeing their chakras. So maybe, like, if we're only seeing a visible light, maybe she's able to see a little beyond that visible light. It's or it's a, just a different thing. It's the spirit spectrum. Correct. It's not, it's not emotion. It's literally into the spirit plane because she was a gypsy. Maybe there's something to this concept that if the Ram came from India 
and the Brahmcast of Indian people with the third eye are able to access the chakras through that third eye, which is supposed to be the pineal gland where melatonin comes from, that they're able to be in a waking dream state, Correct. which allows them to have access to more information. And that we think of the pineal gland as being, oh, that's where melatonin comes from. It converts tryptophan into serotonin and serotonin into melatonin, and it helps you fall asleep. That could be one one hundredth of its actual function. It's just we're completely oblivious to the actual spiritual functions of parts of your brain. Are you familiar with the work of Rick Straussman, DMT, the spirit molecule, which, uh, you know, they did the film that Joe Rogan was the host of i just okay. happened to have it right here <laughs> um but in he was doing clinical laboratory experiments with basically shooting people up with dmt and he recreated alien abduction phenomena near-death experience um people who do ayahuasca from all different cultures often report interactions with the same type of beings and many of these beings have resemblance to say the you know, the, go the gods of ancient Egypt, where it's like an animal head with a human body. Um, so there's all these common themes that, you know, it's all hinting at what is obvious to me in that reality is a much stranger place than it seems to be on the surface. It's broader. It's just that the heavens aren't a geographical place above us. Is that these spirit beings, be they angels or aliens or gods, are actually just spirit beings, and it's a different dimension. You got the four dimensions of X, Y, Z, and time, and then there's a fifth dimension, which is the spirit dimension. And there might be more than one spirit dimension. Well, there might be dimensions of thought, right, dimensions of feeling, exactly. dimensions of that. And I would, and, um, you're calling these dimensions, I want to use the word frequency. Where if the brain is a receiver that really you're tuning in to basically a different channel or you're allowing for a wider range of channels to come in, which allow you to interact with beings that, you know, they might be right here around us the whole time, but because we're not, we're this physical frequency or we're, we're slowed down into physical matter rather than other frequencies that may, that we're not able to interact with except for like in altered dimension. states. So I like the term dimension because if you took a piece of paper and you drew a stick figure, that's a two-dimensional person. And the way we perceive that two-dimensional person is the way those spirit beings probably perceive us. With such a lofty viewpoint of perspective and power, because they can just crumple, you can just crumple a two-dimensional fucker up and throw him away. So like if Cthulhu rises... And anyone who comes in contact with Cthulhu goes insane. It's because you've got a fifth dimensional being moving our fourth dimensional space. So whereas one person just perceives tentacles, another person perceives a claw. It's like the blind people and the elephant. That four blind people touch an elephant. One thinks that it's a tree trunk. Mm -hmm. One thinks that it's a snake. One thinks that it's like a branch. And one thinks it's a giant spear. Because one's touching its leg, one's touching its tail, one's touching its trunk, and one's touching its tusk. And one's, and so, one's uh, tugging on his wang. Well, it's a few people. Say it's a <laughs> but the point is, you don't really know what you're talking about because the... Um, you're, the not, the you're not perceiving the whole picture. You're not perceiving the whole thing. So with DMT, you're now able to perceive more of it. And so now you're able to see the gods of Egypt. And now that may mean that the crown point on the pyramid doesn't shoot the soul up to the stars. It allows the spirit to be reintroduced to that fifth plane. And now that being becomes a being of pure spirit in the high umbra or the high dimensional plane or the astral space, mm -hmm. rather than going to the shadow plane with the lands of the dead like Tartarus. Right. And really so that's the D and D bullshit comes in where now I start seeing things as different planes of reality and the physical plane is just one place to go. But at, at the heart <laughs> of this whole mystery is the death phenomenon. And honestly, like I feel that doing these psychedelics is almost preparation for the afterlife in the same way that lucid dreaming might be where we're learning new ways of existing through consciousness 
because this body is not going to last. So when we pass on, it's going to be in that space of consciousness. And the question is, are you able to hold on to your consciousness as you have, as you move from one side to the other? Like E equals MC squared. If that's true, then, you know, on one side of this equation, we have matter. And you have to go to the other side, which is spirit. And that it's preparing the mind for that transition. And if you can hold on to that, perhaps you can escape this whole game as I think of it. Back. So if you are conscious mind and you're able to keep your memories intact when you become a being of pure spirit, then when at your whim you can just re-manifest a physical body. Well or more likely you could just possess people. And are, that's what demonetization would be. Have you ever read a lucid dream? Well, it's, I like to experiment with lucid dreaming, and one thing I learned early on is that you can, it's one thing to become lucid in the dream, and it's another thing to be able to hold on to that. And I really think of the dream world as the best example we have of the space that we're really accessing through things like DMT, and it takes a certain will, a certain focus. <laughs> In order to hold on, uh, it's um, it's so easy to just slip back into the dream. But if this world is another form of dream, like I all, even in waking life, I feel like I'm trying to have a remembering of where my awareness is. I'm always thinking, "Where's my awareness?" You get lost in thought. When you're trying to med okay. like you're trying to meditate, you're trying to hold on to this focus of your awareness, but the next thing you know, it's lost somewhere. I think what you okay, so ancient Egypt, Horus's eye represented awareness. That the god, the supreme gods all had awareness. Have you seen the the diagram of the brain where the pineal gland looks exactly like uh, the eye of Horus from a certain no, slice? But, that makes sense. but go on, so, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think awareness is something you're talking about, but you summed this up earlier when you were like, I'm not even really seeing you. There's electromagnetic radiation entering my eyes. I've got rods and cones that interprets it. The electrical signals are set to my optic nerve back in my occipital lobe where the image is upside down. And then my conscious mind uses the filter of my memories to be able to perceive the image and attribute it meaning. And so what you're saying is you feel like you're living in a dream and that is true, that you're basically consciously perceiving data input through this flesh and blood machine that isn't an accurate representation. The way you look on a screen right now as life is absorbed by this camera and transmitted through the Internet isn't how you'd look if I was there in person. I can look at video of me on stage and know that I don't look like that because the people next to me didn't look like the way they did on stage. The lighting is totally off. It completely changes things. It's a two-dimensional image, not a three-dimensional image. So we're only perceiving three dimensions. What about the fourth dimension? We can't see how old somebody is. Hold there on, change you know. that old. You're hitting, and we can't see their fifth dimension. But you're hitting on something, though, because in this, if a objective reality actually exists, exists around us, the only thing there is is information traveling on waves of frequency. Remember the you, idea from the Chinese philosophies. Do you know the remember those uh those three D images from like the nineties where you had to focus your eyes weird and the image would pop out? Where it's a Tyrannosaurus Rex that turns into a sailboat? Yes. <laughs> like from Mall Rats. <laughs> yeah. Um like if that's what I think of as the actual universe around us, if it exists, it's it's called an interference pattern. It's the inter interaction of waves they talk about this at the end of xenogears when you get to the very end of the game of xenogears you find out that reality doesn't exist there's just one wave of energy that there is no matter that we're spirits all grouped together in this one sea of information and we collectively subjectively agree on a parameter of interaction that is a false perception of the physical plane which is an illusion I would, and that nothing's real i would agree with all of that that we're all connected through spirit energy. And so when we were talking off camera before we got started about masks, it's like that's how the characters perceive it when they go from one dimension to the next dimension, is that there's a new system of rules 
And their advantage over the inhabitants of that dimension is they know the new system of rules. So when they reconstruct their avatar, they build their character appropriately. Like on this plane, you do damage with the strength attribute, but you attack with the dexterity attribute. So I need both. In this plane, you can choose to be a finesse warrior and you do attack and damage with dexterity. Whereas this plane, there's no finesse options. You use strength for attack and damage, but you need dex to dodge. So it's like you choose how you build your avatar based off of that. So I think a large thing is an awakened being would be able to understand the rules of the collective subjective environment they're in and change accordingly. An example is watching nine-year-olds play basketball. They don't know the rules. So the one or two kids that actually know the rules, like which hoop are we supposed to throw the ball through, they win. The other kids that are throwing it through hoops at random or the wrong hoop, they lose. So that's how I've got friends who know the rules, but they don't like the rules, so they play the game of life by the way they think the rules should be, not the way they are. So you get a lot of these leftists that are super pissed all the time. And the reason why they're pissed is they're like, this is the way it should be. This is right. You're wrong. And we're over here like, okay, but we're winning. And you're losing because even if the rules are wrong, if you play by the rules, you win at the game of life. If you try to play the game of life by non-existing rules, you're going to lose. So an example is I coach women who they don't want to weigh themselves on the scale. And they're like, I don't want to see the number. It's like, I don't care. Like, you need to know what you weigh so we can use the triangle of math and figure out how much – there's calories in, calories out, net result. If we can't calculate your calorie result, the only data we have is calories in and how much you weigh. That if we decrease the calories in and eventually that number on the scale is going to go down. Once we calculate a rate of descent, I can reverse engineer based on what you intake, what your output is. Like if you're losing one pound of fat a week, you're at a negative 500 a day or negative 3,500 calorie a week output. This is objective data. I need to have it. There's no fucking negotiating. You must do, you must comply. <laughs> and it's like men will be more than happy to do it. Women don't want to follow directions because I'm not a doctor to them. I'm just a man. And they think that they're betraying the feminist community by listening to a man, that they can't divorce themselves from gender and just say, this is a scientist. I paid him to use a scientific approach to alter my body. I need to follow the directions for him to do that. And so it's the same type of thing is that people don't want to accept reality. They want to play the game by the way they think the rules should be. And so you can bitch and complain about how it's your thyroid right. that you're 300 pounds so you're blue in the face. It ain't fucking true that – no matter how shitty your thyroid is, you could cut that goddamn thing out. If you decrease your calories low enough, you're going to start losing weight. That it's a, a math thermodynamics of mass conservation. And the thyroid plays into it about 10%. Damn, and yeah. that's why the, this collective subjective, people don't want to play by the rules of the collective subjective. They want to do their own version of reality. They live in a dream world. They have their heads in the cloud. They don't have their feet on planet Earth. They don't join the human race. However you want to put it, they don't work within the parameters of reality, and so they fail at life. And I think those people are the ones who are most likely to get this concept of there being just this fluid reality and that reality is an illusion. But the subjective willpower of the community shapes – the rules. If everyone on Earth believed dragons were real, then fucking dragons would start to be real. But enough people disbelieve in dragons that it ain't real. So I think maybe that's why all the vegans are so in insistent that they're right, is maybe if enough people were vegans, it would actually work. But I think then at that point, the standards of um, health would just change. Like, for instance, a lot of bodybuilders are said to not have healthy blood work because our blood work's not normal. And it's like, no, we're healthier than you guys. We've got better than your blood work. So a lot of these myths that bodybuilding and steroids are bad for your kidneys, bodybuilding and steroids are bad for your liver, they're just misreading the labs. 
that they're not looking at your kidneys when they say your kidneys are bad. They're looking at your creatinine. Right. And your creatinine is a byproduct of how much muscle you have and kidneys. And then they're looking at your ALT and AST, and you're like, oh, your liver's failing. We only see this number with alcoholics, and they have liver damage. And like, but if you look at my liver with an ultrasound or a biopsy, it's fine. And that these enzymes are not just found in liver, they're found in muscle. So the fact that I have muscle trauma because I just came from the fucking gym means I've looped AST, ALT, and creatinine into my bloodstream. You're a fucking doctor. You're the worst detective ever. You suck. Uh, I definitely think you touched on a lot of good things in there, and I'm glad that you brought some of these things up. Um, like This is the first episode of this podcast, and one of the main things I want to do is figure out the rules of the game of life so that right. we can better play it as opposed which, to these people who are trying to make their own rules which are not helping them get anywhere and really at the heart of this whole thing i believe is this concept known as spiritual enlightenment like we're thrown into this world we're not given any rules like let's imagine this as a role playing game Let's say this is Final Fantasy. And you can look at the rule book and know exactly what the fuck to do. They tell it, like, you go talk to one guy and he gives you a clue of somewhere to go. But in this world, there's almost infinite possibilities. Uh, like, you can explore any way you want. And really, all of it is trying to distract you. It's all, the illusion is all there to prevent you from seeing what's actually there. And instead, you're seeing all of what seems to be there. So what I'm really trying to do is to lay down the rules so that we can better know how to navigate the space in order to beat the game. So how do you beat the game? It's by transcending it with awareness. Right. Okay. So in other words, rather than trying to get the big house, have the fancy car, have the girlfriend with the biggest boobs. You're supposed to be trying to understand yourself well enough to where you can just turn into spirit energy and go to a better level. You kind of. Level by moving up a ladder of spiritual enlightenment, not by getting more material bullshit. But while that material bullshit is the distraction, it's also revealing its opposite. So let's say you get all those things and you have the success that you think you're supposed to get, but you don't find the fulfillment. Right. There's the hollow feeling of after you've achieved a goal, there's missing something rather what? than having something. Or because what you, what you had before was the ambition and the accomplishment of moving closer to a goal. It's kind of like what I see with a lot of relationships where the girl wants the guy she gets the guy, and then she's bored with the guy. But the guy that she never really gets because he's got commitment issues, <laughs> she'll do anything for him, and she's wrapped around his finger because she's trying to win. But once she's won, she's bored, and she needs to play again. And it's about chasing a dopamine fix. That the passion, there's no more passion, meaning there's no dopamine fix. That she's a dopamine addict, and she needs dopamine. So some people do cocaine, some people do heroin, some people eat candy, some people lift weights, or some people fuck strangers. Mm -hmm. And that's how they get their dopamine fix. Mm -hmm. And the tr I, to me, it's you don't chase the dopamine. That you, instead of having a dopamine deficiency, find out what in your life you're missing and why are you dopamine deficient. Like, are you not sleeping enough? Maybe if you slept more and had a more um, healthy diet, your body would make that dopamine. And she wouldn't be out chasing dopamine all the time. And it's like how pregnant chicks will eat dirt because they don't have enough iron in their diet because they don't eat red meat because it's bad for you. It's like because your body knows what you need to grow a healthy baby and it's going to make you fucking do it whether you like yep. it or not. Mm -hmm. And it's like all that bullshit about not eating meat, fuck that. But you have to eat dirt then because you have to get iron somehow. So I think that what we do is we use science to try to figure out the rules by saying, oh, you can turn on mTOR with leucine, but you don't want to turn it on too much because there might be a side effect from being doing too much leucine. And it's like, well, if our mitochondria stop working, we're going to get cancer. And we're doing all the scientific research. And it's like, how about some research on how to not be a piece of shit? 
you know, how about a research on how much better it is to be honest than be a liar? He's like, why isn't there any research into that? Because well, it that, might just be obvious. <laughs> well, it's it's obvious. Then I mean, Rob Jordan Peterson wouldn't be the most popular man on the planet. Yeah. And you have the forces of evil trying to give him panic attacks constantly by abusive interviews to the point where he has to check himself into rehab. You know, it's like the poor dude's just trying to help people be happy, and the miserable people are so scared of the concept that everyone's not going to be miserable that they have to tear the fucker to pieces. But here in this space, like everything is the opposite. Like in order to be healthy, you have to do the opposite of like the health guidelines the authorities give us. In order to survive your doctor, you have to do the opposite of what they're trying to do to you. So that's interesting. I think that's just with health. I think it's the health. Everything is. People don't want to have a fucking brain. They want everything told to them that the red pill's good, the blue pill's bad. And that they want to... So everybody's talked to like they're a fat pig. Uh That all the health guidelines work if you're a fat, sedentary turd. Then, if you follow the health guidelines, you'll be less unhealthy than if you don't. Hold on, but if we're we're applying the concept of role-playing game to this, how many of those people are NPCs? All of them. That the player characters are the ones out there busting ass to go up levels. Like you, I'm gonna go to the gym and get some experience points. Hold on here though, like you're, you say, talking to a woman, you need to eat red meat because you need iron. How many of them give you the exact same gut response of I don't want to do that, or you need to weigh yourself, I don't want to, or I often do it like I talk talk to people about the nutrition in sardines right away. Ugh, I don't like sardines. Like I I get the same response. Over and over and over, and I see, like... I don't get that response like that as much from dudes. That most guys, I think it's because I'm a doctor, they just say, you know what, the guy's three-time national champion bodybuilder, six-time state champion bodybuilder, medical doctor, and a biochemist. He might know more than me about how my body works. Whereas what I heard from women is, you're a man, so you couldn't possibly know how my body works. I'm a woman. <laughs> I've literally had them look me in the eye and say that before. That I can see. <laughs> but yeah. um, but like still. How many babies do you want to do? And they'll be like, none. And it's like, well, so how do I? How many vaginas have you operated on? It's like, how many breast cancer tumors have you removed? And it's like, what the fuck do I need to do to accomplish enough female medicine to actually qualify as knowing how your body works? You know, when you don't know where your uterus is, you know. But wait, hold on. Is there, like, something else you might say to men where you're getting the same reaction? Like, it may not be bodybuilding. It might be certain nutritional or lifestyle. Cause this, I don't get that level of knee-jerk stubbornness. This is something. I don't have that fake reality where I literally do not see the disconnect with reality with men that I see with women. Women literally live in a universal bubble where their version of reality has almost nothing to do with the real world. Men have a much more concrete grasp of reality. I, but, all right, I'm talking about um, trying to determine the rules of the game here. One thing I'm always looking for are repeating patterns. So when I okay, see... So I can see men being less open-minded to is gender role bending. Yeah, that might be so something, yeah. That women are way less homophobic than men are typically. That they're, they're, they're just because you build a thousand bridges and suck one dick doesn't make you a dick sucker. But You're we, still a bridge. We can get away from people, though. Like, um, oh. Let's say I'm driving, and everywhere I go, there's a car pulling out in front of me and going slow. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm always looking for this repetition. Like, let's say this is literally a video game, mm-hmm. and how if this is the level I'm on, I'm driving. How is the video game going to try to like throw me off? It's going to put obstacles in my path, but mm-hmm. I don't know I'm playing a game. But when I start seeing the same repeating patterns, that's when I okay, time for where's my awareness. What's my mind doing? How do I 
what's the situation telling me about what I need to do right now in order to beat this level, basically. And that's one of the things I use are these repeating patterns. That's my clue to pay attention, or synchronicity. But do what, you think that the universe is really working actively against you? I think it's act working against me as my clue to wake the fuck up and pay attention because it's in paying attention that I'm going to succeed in whatever situation I'm in. And it's giving me these clues because there's, I almost feel like there's something trying to wipe my mind constantly. Like I said, like if you're trying to meditate and your mind starts to wander, it's the same thing. We're talking about, I'm defining meditation. your attention away from what you should be thinking about. I'm defining meditation as focus, but at the same time, there's right. something that's always trying to take my attention away and break that focus. So, so focus entropy. Uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> uh, well, constantly battling against and a tendency away from focus, a constant distraction from the main purpose of life, which is spiritual transcendence. Right, and then at the same time, that distraction is allowing... Er, in one sense, it's trying to prevent me from waking up. And when I say waking up, I mean to be in my awareness in the moment now, in that Zen state. Mm -hmm. On one hand, it's trying to distract me from it. But if I can notice these incongruities, these synchronicities, these patterns, then that's when I have, it's almost a remembering. I remember to wake up. It's, it's the same thing as when you become lucid in a dream. So what would be the skill set you're trying to impart to your viewers with that? How do we use what you just said? The way I do this in, in, ev in any situation, I try to see what the universe is trying to get me to do. And it's, I find it's often the opposite of what I want to do. I like have to swallow my pride. I have to go against myself because that's what it's trying to get me to do. I have to, so, and I won't notice that if I'm not paying attention, if I don't have the awareness of what my body and my, like, this disconnect between what my body wants to do and what the universe seems to want me to do. All right, so what I'm hearing you're saying is the what you need to do the most is the thing you're not doing. Not In well, a sense. So let me convert it to bodybuilding because some of people might follow this. People are like, oh, I'm on all these steroids and I'm not growing. And it's like, do you go to the gym? <laughs> they're like, yeah. And then they're like, okay, like, what do you do at the gym? I lift. And then you have them detail their workout, and their workout's pretty good. And then you're like, okay, what's your diet like? They're like, shit. I was like, okay, so what you're not doing is eating correctly. If you eat correctly, you will start to grow. And so – it's way harder to have discipline when it comes to not eating certain things and force feeding yourself to eat other things than it is in just injecting something in your body or lifting weights. Now, the same could be true for other things like business. It's like, what aren't you doing? Well, it's like, well, I'm not doing my Instagram post three stories a day and one picture a day and one video a week. So my business isn't growing. Okay, well, you need to start doing that. And they start doing that, and their business starts growing. So is that basically what you're saying? Um, all right, let me ask you this. Have you ever driven home and then realized you just pulled into your driveway and you have no you recollection know, of the drive home? You were in the car with me the last time that happened, remember? Oh. <laughs> it's like, I, I, like the cops were pulling me over. Oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> you you went from Canada I do remember to, to like Sterling Heights, Bad memory. and then I, we made it within one mile of our house, Yes, and that's when I got pulled over. Yes. <laughs> kind of. To, but I wouldn't let you drive. You even had me get out of the car. <laughs> yes, the, I was I was so... I tried to get in the driver's seat. Yes, and, and you would not let me. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally and would have taken a I different drank. route home. And that's the last time I drank 20 years ago. Um, 22 months. Like, have you ever put down your keys and not remembered where they are? All the time, especially on a, a keto diet. Okay, so this shows the disconnect between mind and body. Your mind is somewhere, and your body is doing something else. Like, your body's off on its own. 
That is the state of mind most people are in all the time. Because you're saying a zero awareness. Zero awareness. If you're okay. in that state, you're not going to notice any of the things I'm talking about because your mind is just wandering. You have no focus. This is what I'm calling focus also as meditation. This is the Zen state. When okay. you have that awareness and you're able to pay attention to these things, and what I'm saying is I, I go into that state all the time too and my mind wanders. But then I see these patterns and these synchronicities and things, and that's how I remember to wake up, to focus my awareness in the moment. This is, you know, literally in the moment, <laughs> what they talk about. And only in the moment can I start reading the cues around me to try to decipher whatever action I think, like, you know, I'm. I might just be making all this up. <laughs> I could just be crazy. <laughs> but, so, let me think of an example. Is it like the black cat scene in The Matrix? Where the yes. person, where Neo had the deja vu, and they're like, there is no real deja vu. The deja vu means the Matrix setting. And, like, right, and, like, earlier, uh, yesterday I was doing something, and I had a deja vu of a deja vu. And I'm I've like, done that and I just, and I'm like, how many times have I been in this exact moment? Like, and how many times have I been unaware of what I'm doing? <laughs> well, basically what I'm hearing is when you have a deja vu moment, recognize patterns, it reminds you that you're in a f in the matrix, that there's a waveform and none of this is real, but it's a collective subjective that's imposed on you. And the key is to manifest your ability to control, like Neo, see the ones and the zeros and become like a god amongst men controlling the actual matrix. Ding, ding, ding. Okay. Except. And that, okay. So therefore, I do that. And like, for instance, I was driving the other day and they're like, oh my God, we're going to die. You can't see anything and you're a terrible driver. And I was like, yeah, but the thing is, bad things don't happen to me. They're like, don't say that. <laughs> horrible things happen to people who say that. I'm like, no, this isn't a horror movie. <laughs> bad things don't happen to me. And so I just use the force of my will to just make shit work out for me, which is like you made fun of the secret earlier, but I use that stuff. You talked about Aleister Crowley earlier. <laughs> Aleister Crowley's biggest quote is, "Do as the thou will wilt. shall be the whole of the law." Uh, Do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Exactly, which is based a lot on Descartes' philosophy of existentialism, which is, "I think, therefore I am." Well, so if I think I'm a demigod, I'll be a motherfucking demigod. Here, if I think I'm a loser, I'm gonna be a fucking but I also describe spirituality as learning to break down the ego and everything that we think of as ourselves and all this programming that's been put on us from birth, all our desires, all our wants, everything that we makes up what we think is who we are. And the ultimate goal is to learn that you are not you, you are actually the whole. This is just right. an illusion of separation, which creates the dualistic reality so you're talking about Neo becoming a god amongst men, being able to dodge bullets and shit. The only way I think that's going to happen is if you completely let go of your whole ego, which allows basically the universe to instead inhabit your being where you are on one part yourself, but on the other part you are the whole. And only in that state will you be the god amongst men. And in that state, you are not in control. You have given up all control. You are no longer attached to any outcome. You are no longer trying to make a desire or any of the secret shit happen. Instead, you are allowing what will happen, happen. The universe will move through you. And if the universe wants you to walk through a wall or dodge a bullet, that's the only way it's going to happen. Kind of like the, um, I am the Alpha, the Omega that I'm omniscient and omniscient, and then I am all things, basically a lot of the Yahavohe quotes from the Old Testament. Perhaps that, that is hinting at, but, you know, we have these esoteric traditions, I would say that come, like, from the Kabbalah, which I consider an ancient system of enlightenment training. Just like what Zen. Is that Instead of ones and zeros, you see 26 letters. Well, but it's still... Um, 
I like it though. I think that's a right. great analogy. But if this is a computer simulation, maybe it's not binary. Maybe it's twenty six area, <laughs> or maybe it's one hundred and fifty elements, or whatever. But you know, the question is, what is or it's all those things? Right. And the one thing I am have no claim to know anything about is what is there actually controlling it. Well, that's just the concept of if it, there is a collective subjective, then the objective omnipotent force would be the collective subjective. So the trick would be to awaken and transcend being a sleeper agent of the collective subjective and being something that actually orchestrates and moves the other souls and that you can harness the power of all the souls to actually impose your will on all of the fake reality. Well, and you get to guide the direction of the collective subjective. But what if something is uh, pulling those strings on us here? This we'll climb up the rope to who's actually pulling your strings, slit their throat, and now you be the puppet master. And so that would be an evil desire for power. The concept that there's only two ends of a whip. Which end do you want to be on? And it's like, obviously, I'm the type of person who says I want to be holding the whip. And everyone else says there shouldn't be a whip. It's like, that's great. Exactly. You play the game that you want to play. I'm going to play the game that actually is. I'm going to play so the game, game of life. <laughs> Wait, so if the game of life says there's two ends of a whip, pick one. I'm grabbing the handle. I'm not going to say this is wrong and reject the rules of the game. I'm already there trying to win it. Boom. So, why hashtag winning is one of my favorite tags is because it's not hashtag virtue um, signaling. It's hashtag winning. And like another example of people say, oh, you're a victim shamer. I'm like, being a victim is shameful. It means you lost. <laughs> you failed to succeed in some major way. Something dominated, controlled, or hurt you. And now you're drawing attention to it. You're like, hey, look at me. I'm a loser. Somebody took advantage of me and I let it happen. I would be ashamed of that. If I got raped, my lips would be fucking sealed. I'm waiting a couple of years, Wait. killing that guy, <laughs> disposing of the body. No one's ever tying that crime to me. If I tell everyone so-and-so raped me and then they disappear, then they're going to know I murdered the motherfucker. You're a suspect. Yeah. So you got to just pretend like nothing fucking happened. But, you know, these like, traumas are this type of programming that I'm specifically talking about that we need to break down, that you were saying is like the mask. Mm -hmm. Part of our mask is this culmination of the traumas we've had since birth. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one aspect of it. You're filtering reality through the perception of the scars of your history. That basically, if you don't scar, you get to see things more clearly. If you're, if for instance, if I walk up to a woman and I ask her for her number, and she's like, I just got out of an abusive relationship, so I'm not dating. What I'm basically hearing is, I'm so emotionally scarred by this previous man, I'm not capable of seeing different men as different from this last man. I'm so primitive, all men are my ex. And I learned or, a, I learned a lot like, of this stuff. Oh, go on, I'm sorry. That basically their history has scarred them so badly, they no longer can perceive things accurately and i learn a lot about this from animals when um an animal without trauma is always in the moment so i i call i think of that as like being enlightened basically it, okay active enlightenment is when your awareness is in the moment and your mind is not wandered or scattered so animals pretty much exist that way all the time unless they have some type of trauma at which point they're suddenly looking around every corner for the next trauma. So, like in that way, I can see in action this idea of the trauma being an overlay of, like it's another, it's almost like a virus over your program that has taken over. That they basically think the history is the future, that history repeats. And because they, they got hurt before, they're going to get hurt again. And they can't get out of that. And, and that would go into the nocebo effect, where they're using the reverse of the secret, where they're having a negative thought and they're forcing a negative outcome. Whereas, I bad things don't happen to me. 
<laughs> I love I that. Because, <laughs> like, like, I didn't just get raped. That's going to happen. <laughs> and then I'm totally less rape crazed than I would be if I believed I got raped. It's like, I totally imagined that. I would totally not buy into it. It's like, Todd Lee does not get raped. Todd Lee does not take things in his ass. <laughs> and so, it's like, that is not fucking happening. <laughs> Maybe that's good for other people. Maybe other people can be victimized. Nobody victimizes me. Bad things don't happen to me. And so that positive outcome is why yesterday I was like, huh, I just got 405 to 10. That's the most I've ever gotten. I've only gotten one other time. I'm going to try 455 because that girl's really hot and I'm too scared to talk to her. But at least I can, what do you call it, lift a whole fuck ton of weight and then maybe she'll notice and then I'll feel more comfortable talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did it. I got 455 to 6, and then I threw up for so long she disappeared. <laughs> so it's like, uh, I just remembered. Uh, than yeah. the girl, it's breaking that PR. And that's because bad things don't happen to me. If I went into that attitude, like, oh, my spine's going to snap. My knee's going to explode. I'm going to throw up on myself. I'm going to piss myself. If I had that attitude, even though all those things have happened, I never would have tried. So if I had that victim mentality, where it's like, no, that's too much for me, it's going to hurt me, then I would have never tried and I wouldn't succeed. But the fact that I believed in myself and I thought bad things don't happen to me and I used the secret and I used positive thinking, it's like I basically bent the matrix. I was able to dodge a bullet. Basically. And – Honestly, I think that is a great place to stop. My cats are starting to rampage. I'm going to have to feed them. Uh, before we wrap it up, why don't you let people know how to find you and your supplements and to follow you on social media and things. Okay, so scroll down to the description section of this YouTube <laughs> and there will be links to my shit. That's how you find me. But I will verbally instruct you beyond that with this. People okay. aren't that smart. <laughs> okay. Well, that's why I tell them. I'm like, look down. <laughs> it's like, okay, at ToddLeeMD is my Instagram. ToddLeeMD.com is my normal website. Valhalla-Labs.com is my supplement website. And for the full Todd Lee experience, I strongly suggest you follow me on Instagram because I put up lifting videos all the time. And my Instagram TV stuff is great. Also, I've got the YouTube channel that's the Valhalla Labs channel, and that has my podcast, which is the Weekly Grind. We just filmed our film, we recorded our 61st episode. So it's it's a lot of fun shit, and it's um, we're not as uh, esoteric and spiritually minded and cerebral as this podcast. It's more like shop talk, bodybuilding like nutrition, training, and then we have luminaries of the bodybuilding community as guests. But if that matters to you, if you want to transcend your flesh along with your spirit, check it out. Thanks awesome. for having me. And it's great talking to you. And I just want to say, proud to be your friend, buddy. Aw, thanks, man. I'm glad that you're proud. I'm proud to be your friend, too. I was just, uh, well, we'll have a normal conversation in a minute after we get off. I'm not sure it'll be normal, but... <laughs> no, it'll, because it was... We were still... I was like, <laughs> it was as weird when we recorded, and this was actually pretty tame. So... Well, we, we got a little out there at the end, but uh, next and time, maybe we'll get even crazy. All the questions you wanted to cover, so if you want to go, go over the other questions on another podcast, I'll, I'll let you Absolutely. I would love to do this again sometime soon. And uh, like you said, I'll link to all your stuff below for those people who can't find it. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. All right, buddy. Bye-bye. Bye. Give it up for Todd Lee, MD, folks. I love that guy. I know, I know what you're thinking. Talking about nutrition and diet and things is not very spiritual. But that's where you would be wrong, my friends. In my opinion, all spiritual work should begin by getting your body good and healthy. That is rule number one. It's easy to be spiritual and feel connected, to be kind and loving, when we're feeling good and things are going well for us. 
But it's a whole nother story when we're feeling bad and things are not going our way. And the universe loves to challenge us and kick us when we're down. So we do the work when we feel good, so that we have the proper perspective when we do not. And making sure our bodies are functioning optimally is our best defense. That's why all the best systems of enlightenment training, such as Zen and yoga, have a physical practice to balance with the mental work. But we have a huge problem in this culture where health is concerned. What I mean is that if you follow the advice given to us by the so-called authorities out there, we're almost guaranteed to die a painful and expensive death from some chronic disease or another. We just can't trust the advice we're given. And so it's up to us individually to learn about the needs of the body. What doctors and dietitians are taught in school is like 40 to 50 years outdated. Most of that information has been proven wrong or overturned since it became standard, but they never throw out the old to make way for the new, and most of them never bother to look into the current research. That's why doctors like Todd Lee are so important. Not only does he know his shit, but he has continued to learn and use his own mind and critical thinking skills to realize that our healthcare system has a decades-long track record of failing to promote health or heal the diseases that are being caused by a lack of micronutrients in our food supply, stress, poor sleep, and the ever-growing list of toxins our bodies have to deal with. And I, for one, want to give him mad props for that. He is a rare individual indeed, and we need more like him out there. But this is all part of the game. Nothing is easy or handed to us in this world. It's up to you and you alone to put your attention onto the things that matter. And if we do not, we risk sleeping through life, a slave to our own mind, lost in this grand illusion all around us. Todd, if you're listening, thank you so much for being here. It was great to see you, great to talk to you, and I am seriously looking forward to our next conversation. To everyone else out there, thank you so much for listening. I have a few more of these episodes all ready to go with some amazing guests that I'm super excited to share with you, and I have a few solo shows coming up when I'll really start breaking down this philosophy of how I play the game and why I think using this video game analogy approach to spirituality is so powerful. Just like any good instruction manual, we'll be looking at the basic premise of the game, the objectives, the plot, how to play, and most importantly, all the tools and everything you need to know to win. We're brand new, so please help us grow by liking and subscribing, and leave us a comment letting us know what you think. I hope you will join us again next time as this quest for enlightenment continues. But until then, try not to take yourself so seriously. We're living in a video game for crying out loud. Beep.